G'day brothers and sisters, this is The Other Paul and I am here for a exciting and anticipated stream with Craig Truglia. Craig, how are you going today? It's always good to be in The Other Paul, that's for sure. Absolute, darn, darn right it is, mate. Darn right every single time. My guests, my guests love coming on. But uh, today we will be discussing uh, Craig Truglia's newly released book, The Rise and Fall of the Papacy, um, which I'm very excited to get uh, talking about because it really is a unique, whether you agree with what he says or not, it really is a unique work in the, uh, in the papal apologetics and polemics uh, sphere. So uh, Craig, um, well, so your day's going well, and I kind of had a little bit of a brain spasm at the moment there. So tell us, why did you feel the need to make this book to start with? Uh, it's silly as it sounds. There just weren't any good ones on the topic I felt. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, uh, I read a lot of primary sources and people would ask me, well, what book you recommend? And I really said, you just got to read the sources. I don't know any good book. Well, at least now I got one I can recommend. <laughs> <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah. I noticed, um, I noticed with your book, you take much more care to emphasize the nature of good historiography, something we'll definitely get more into uh, as we as we go down, because we have a we have a interesting script for how we want to proceed today. Um, but before we jump right into that, I am going to give a shout out to my legendary supporters on locals who make everything that I do here possible. And if you want to help me with what I do on my channel, help me bring up more work in quantity and in greater quality. You can become a supporter a supporter through my locals in the link below, and you get some nice benefits out of it as well. Uh, so thank you to these current supporters happening here. And uh, yeah, for anyone new who comes on, thank you in advance for becoming a supporter. So um, it, I it all needs the supporters so we That's can true. upgrade on that uh, notepad file. <laughs> That's right. You're not wrong. You're not wrong. But hey, I love... <laughs> Honestly, I'm I'm the kind of guy where I'm not going to spend money on things like if I don't need something, I'm, I'm not going to spend it now. I mean, hey, nothing beats a little notepad thing. Uh, because there's I, no one that's a worse minimalist than me. I mean, look at this background. <laughs> look at my like my YouTube channel's got more than ten thousand subs, and you still see the Streamyard duck there and stuff like that. It's <laughs> a, I, I'm the biggest minimalist there is, so I'm just having fun. That's absolute. Oh man, that's so true and and actually hilarious. And, and and I actually used to, if you look at some of my streams from a while ago, I used to actually have like a fancy little parchment background with like a fancy font that has all my supporters' names. And the problem is every time I either get a new supporter or, or lost one, I had to re-edit it and that was just a pain in the butt. So I'm hoping to find a solution in the future where it can just be an easy automatic thing. And I think I have an idea for them, but for the time being, nothing beats Notepad. It's clear, gets to the point. <laughs> I mean, I know, I'm, I'm just razzing you, but it's, it does speak to different errors within YouTube where there used to be guy with this camera and his pickup truck. Now a channel is, they got teams of writers. They got mm -hmm. multiple camera angles. They bring in for live interviews. Um, the interviews are scripted totally in advance. Uh, it's people expect that a YouTube channel is going to be like a full blown television network and i don't know i guess because i'm an old dude i kind of miss the the old days where you know youtube was just a guy with a good opinion because that's i think more compelling and most of the time i'm at work so i'm just downsizing it and listening i, I don't care what hmm. it looks like yeah absolutely and uh being the good anglican that i am i like to strive for the via media or the middle way where I like to bring up a high production value insofar as it's actually helpful to what I do, but I won't go beyond that. I like to still keep it simple where it's possible. But in any case, um, David Wilson asked, didn't Robert Spencer recently release a book about the papacy? I heard, but I also heard it wasn't the best. It was sure. a year ago. Alan Rule had a kind of like response video to that a year ago. It's shorter. And, and I think that's kind of worth something worth bringing up, which mm -hmm. is, there's a lot of apologetics works and they are what they are. So there's, let's say in one category would be Spencer's book, Lofton's book, you know, like them, hate them, criticize them, don't criticize them. They're not very long. They're not meant to be ultra technical, you know, really in-depth uh, dives into a subject such as this. Um, then there are the ones that try to tend towards comprehensive, like Guyette's Papacy, you know, Eric Barr's book, where they attempt to be fairly comprehensive with everything, you know, you could possibly read on 
the subject. Um, I'd like to think my book is not really like any of those because it's really more of a history. Um, and if you really want to, on the other side, a very interesting approach at uh, just a plain history, it would be Keys of the Christian World by Scott Butler and John Kalaraki. And it's because it's, speaking of minimalism, it almost doesn't even have a narrative. It yeah. has the bare bones of a narrative. So just so you could then just delve into historical mm. sources. Uh, so yeah, I remember uh, looking at so that. that would be a little more historical one. I remember looking at that keys of the Christian world and it's almost, it's almost just like a katana basically. Like as you, as you say, not even much narrative. It has, it has some to kind of tie it all together, but not, not a whole time, which I actually quite, I, I quite like about it. And, yeah, I, I do, I do yeah. too. I wouldn't call it a quote mine. So it feels like, Oh, it's just like a really, really long quote mine. It has far too much context to be a quote mine. Mm -hmm. And there is, yeah. it's sort of like, it takes into, takes for granted that you actually care enough to know a lot of some of the contextual factors so for the context it does give, even though it's minimalistic, you'll be filling in the gaps if you're right. informed. And so it's, I kind of like a book that expects a lot from its reader. So that, that's why I do like Keys of the Christian World. That's fair enough. That's fair enough. I said we have Christian Murray in the chat, mate. Good to see you here. Um, and now, so I understand we have a, there's a, we have a particular layout of how you want to proceed basically with just demonstrating what's your book's argument, what's your main thrust and what have you. Um, but even just before that as well, as a give us a really quick summary, a really quick uh, one minute, two minute, whatever uh, pitch. Why should someone buy your book and not just something else by, like, say, Edward Denny's Papalism, which is quite big and comprehensive, um, or any other books on the matter? Why? Why yours? I think that for one, if you're just interested in history, like. You're an Anglican, you're not Orthodox, you're not Roman Catholic or whatever. You're just interested in history. Well, this is a book about history, and it goes through essentially the whole first millennium of church ecclesiology and the implication of that on Rome. So if you just want to know what happens and really not to get into polemics or anything like that, I think a book like this is very useful. I also think because it's not it's not very austere in a narrative sense, it does help the reader along to kind of get what's going on. I do think it's written at a, about 11th grade reading level. And so it's it's approachable, it's got the content. And so I think it's very useful um, for the reader. I also think that other previous attempts at this subject have major methodological problems, which we'll unpack here. And that's on both sides, Roman Catholics and the anti-Roman Catholic side, which should be generally um, something like the Edward Denny's papalism or, or, or something like that. But um, I'll read this, and this is something written by a Roman Catholic apologist in reviewing my book. It's from John Calarafi. And it is that, by the way. <laughs> and it's, oh, he is. Oh, hi, John. And it's qualified <laughs> endorsement in the book. The, the reason I bring it because John doesn't like endorsing or really being mentioned or anything. But it's because we're talking about the difference between this and other books. I'll just quote John for his opinion how this is different from other books. He says, Craig is at least trying to cover events from the first eight centuries. Reading Gaillette, I found that he had left vast periods of time without even trying to make it an argument. Denny's papalism gives, uh, I found that, uh, gives patristic texts encased in polemical arguments like flies trapped in amber. Welton and two paths denied the authenticity of critically important texts from St. Maximus. Craig, on the other hand, did make an effort to find new sources. And even where he went to familiar talking points like the false decretals, he tries to bring in specificity. He uses some recent scholarship rather than bludgeon us a generic claptrap about the papacy being based on forgeries. I feel quite comfortable if people study both our books critically, considering sources, type, and range sources used, and style, whether primary historical or polemical. Etc. So I, I I guess I cite that because it kind of gives you a lay of the land of what to expect from these books and what not to expect from my book. Um, and I, I do think that reader from pretty much anyone, Orthodox, Roman Catholic, Protestant, would profit a lot reading this book. They learn a lot of history. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I have to I have to uh, attest as well, having uh, gotten an early draft of it um uh, for uh for help on uh various other issues i learned a lot myself as well it's pretty pretty epic um but in any case john john Colorado himself actually answers 
Any chance that the other Paul would, uh, would agree to shave off his beard in return for a six-figure razor company endorsement? You'd be stupid not to. I, I, I th honestly, I think I would be. Honestly, that's probably one of the very few <laughs> excuses where I probably would shave off my whole. Paul would do it for a three-figure. <laughs> okay, no, 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 no. Oh, no. I, I, $900. I still have some dignity for the beard, so no, I'm not gonna do it for nine hundred hey, bucks. Give but... me nine hundred dollars, I'll grow a beard. Well, there you go. I guess nine hundred dollars. <laughs> go to orthodoxpresentology.com/slash/donate. Make the donation, then write down beard, and then I'm just have to just grow for that nine hundred dollars. So there you go. <laughs> That's beautiful, absolutely beautiful. But in any case, let's jump into the details. So. We have a pretty specific plan for wanting to outline more or less the basic argument of your book. And we will start with defining the papacy. So what is the papacy? I mean, simply it's just the episcopacy of the city of Rome, other than maybe the Avignon papacy. And I I really think Christians of all denominations can't be like so OCD, like when they deal with history, because they get into this, this city is this, and that city is that, but every city's had these like uh, uh, episcopacies and exile, and it, it's like, all right, so let's not get wacky about it. Just say, listen, all right, papacy is the episcopacy of Rome. But it's interesting because it kind of gives us the problem of language, which is like really in the first thousand years of church, the word papacy is not used. It's an 11th century term. It comes from the Latin uh, papatus. Now, I'm not the resident Latin expert here, but from what I read from people that are reading Latin, it carries the implication of the Roman bishop, bishop perhaps being in a class above the normal episcopate. All right. So even if that is, according to the study of Latin, maybe going too far, the fact that it gives that impression to people shows you that even using the word implicitly grants cred credibility to Vatican I, or at least the seeds of it. And this shows you that the lexicon itself is pretty much playing with loaded dice, right? If, oh, I, I want to expect a lot from the audience, Paul. If people read the book 1984, people would know there's something called Newspeak, right? And the idea of Newspeak is if they could reduce the language where there's almost no way to describe anything, people will lose the capacity for critical thought, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's part of the book 1984. Well, why is this relevant? It shows you that... Language not only ports meaning, it kind of infects how we think. And so how do we study something like the papacy where even the word gets us already thinking a certain way? Mm -hmm. This is why I think, his, and it's not just papacy, it's any historical subject requires a lot of deprogramming because there's things that we make presumptions from, from simple words that do affect how we analyze things. Yeah, yeah. So that's good that you we get that out of the way as an initial thing just to get it just to get it start with just to get it started because how one defines the papacy in my experience can really frame how a debate is going to go forward because I, I personally am, uh, I will experience sometimes a Roman apologist whom I'm dialoguing with and they'll give they'll give something of a very much more loose idea of the papacy one that is that's kind of absent of the very particular claims of say, Vatican of the first Vatican council or other authoritative uh, documents, they'll, 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 they'll give them, they'll give those qualities, but in a much more generic way, which as a result, if it doesn't go unchallenged, it gives them a lot more proof text to work with because many of those proof texts are much more generic claims about the authority of Rome and not very specific. So that's good and important that we, that we nail down in more specificity, what is the papacy in particular in, in, and in good detail. And so, yeah. And I think it's also, it's just of interest to the historian, yeah. right? We're approaching a topic. And first, it's even the language of the topic affects how we approach it. Mm. So that's problematic. We got to be mindful of it, right? Now, of course, words have meaning. And if the meaning's true, then it could be helpful in approaching the topic. But we have to be mindful of it. We can't just ignore the concept that that's what's going on in our language and our culture. Um. And so I think it's historians have to be mindful of the words they use to ask questions, even why they're asking the questions. Absolutely. Absolutely. So in light of knowing what the papacy is, why do we care about papal history? 
Well, I think that's a fundamental question because it affects how we ask the question affects what answers we get, right? So like, let's just speak normie. Why does the normie person care about the papacy? They like intrigue, right? You know, so this could be even scholarly attempts like uh, Eamon Duffy's Saint and Sinners. I mean, just look at the title, right? <laughs> it just sounds like, you know, some, there's intrigue going on here. There's TV shows like The New Pope, which is a smutty show with beautiful cinematography. There's popular books like The Da Vinci Code, right? So just think of John Q. Normie, the interest and intrigue and power implicitly kind of builds up the papacy, right? Because there's nothing interesting about a, you know, uh, intrigue and stuff where there's nothing really powerful at work here, right? Mm. So if your interest is in intrigue, you already kind of lend credibility to this idea that there's this powerful institution, which now you've already made this qualitative judgment just by, you know, how you're approaching it. You're looking for intrigue. Now, I think when it looks uh, for people that aren't John Q. Normie, let's say John Q. Normie academic, all right, so there's the normal academic, they're looking at the papacy as like a, in a historically quaint way. The bygone era of strong popes and absolutist emperors and, and stuff mm -hmm. like that. And so like you'd get Chadwick, Price, Luth, Meindorf, Papadakis, you know, that's, they're looking at the papacy and, you know, it's a bygone era, you know, of, of these absolutist sort of popes that they're kings of on earth and they thought they're kings of heaven and, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but you can already see within this sort of approach that they're interested in looking at this bygone era, strong popes, you already have this narrative. There were strong popes, right? And so you, this scholarship, even if they're against, you know, let's say the, the papacy, like, you know, Chadwick's an Anglican, you know, Luth and Papadakis, they're Orthodox. It's, they seem to acknowledge these papal tendencies and events. Because again, their whole idea is there was this bygone era, strong popes. And so because they're approaching the question, looking at this bygone era, you bring in a presumption that might not actually be there, but it finds itself in the narrative. Mm -hmm. Again, I'm asking a lot from the audience. It's a, I'm a terrible book salesman because, right, anyone speaking is complicated, though, again, it's like, honestly, right, you tell me, Paul, this is like 11th grade reading level stuff. I'm using big words, you know, <laughs> but it's we – when we people just take for granted they know how to read history, but they have no idea what they're looking at because yeah. they don't know how they even look at the world. They have to know like why they're asking these questions. So they, these are important details. Now, then we get to the more polemical, the polemical stuff, right? They have religious religious objections to the papacy, right? And so they're writing the book because they hate the papacy and they, and they want to write something completely against it. And so you know, obviously, this would be like traditional objections like Edward Denny's papalism. And I think because these books are overly polemical, there's this tendency on one hand, it's almost schizophrenic. You tell me if you get this from meeting Denny. We'll discount the existence of the papacy altogether. But like then on the other hand, they not only acknowledge the papal tendencies, they use this as a narrative foil to show like how the papacy is defeated, right? And so like if... For example, Denny treats the Sargon canons um, as non-existent, but he also treats what um, Pope Victor did during the Easter controversy as, you know, over, you know, like totalitarian and the church stopped him. But like, you could see how someone like uh, Eric Barra would say, look, well, this shows even people that are against the papacy acknowledge the Pope was doing papal stuff. And that papal stuff is Vatican I stuff, is what they mean by it. And so even those who tend towards the polemical, they really hate the papacy, they, they for narrative reasons, started inferring from events things that are from the second millennium that really aren't in the sources. So again, me speaking historically, I don't like that. I'm not down with that. Mm, okay. Um, so I think that's uh, something to take note of. And also for those who aren't aware, because they're just cheap and so they're, they're just going to read books from 100 years ago because they're open source. I'm one of those guys too. I'm cheap too. So I understand. But you also then have to understand if you're doing this, people writing 100 or more years ago were much more transparently polemical um, due to that's just how everyone acted during that time. 
But also because of that, they must, they're they responding to events that were in their time. So like with Denny, he's responding to like very technical terminology that's in Vatican I and in later papal documents, which are kind of irrelevant to the study of history. It's just polemical. So yes, it's meeting the genre of polemics, but it's not always great, I think, for someone reading historically. And I would actually argue if you swim in the current, like you're getting to the papal polemic and you're fighting the papal polemic, the more you swim in that current, even though you're swimming against it, that current will take you with it because you start accepting a lot of the, the rules of what you're fighting against. And again, hence, I think maybe the polemicists could swim those waters, but for the person trying to read history and understand what really happened, I actually think they could be counterproductive. Mm, that's a good point. And so what, from what I understand, you're trying to, you're, or rather you perceive other polemical works against the papacy as more or less apologetics first, history second, whereas you're trying to go history first, apologetics second. Yes, I, it's, I would like to say I'm a perfect historian. This is a completely impartial, you know, attempt at history. And the reality is, you know, no, I'm an Orthodox Christian. I'd be obviously disappointed if I studied the history and I found something contrary to my belief system. But I think first and foremost, there has to be a solid historical methodology. There has to be, because um, again, I'm speaking to people that aren't in my Orthodox choir, right? So mm. I have to make a case. And I think an effective case is not going to be polemical. And so while I try to be transparent mm. with let's say what Orthodox tradition is on a matter. I even in footnotes talk about, you know, certain difficulties with um, certain parts of Orthodox tradition, which are relevant to the historical question. Um, I do think because no one comes at anything totally transparent, I do think I do successfully at least give a good historical inquiry into the subject that's useful to the reader. And then the reader can make up their own mind um, mm -hmm. based on the interpretations and the evidence whether the case is made effectively. Um, I did not write the book, Why You Should Be Orthodox. That's not what the book's about. Um, yeah. the, the book is historical treatment of the history of Rome. Yeah, that's great. That's great. And I, as also one who loves to be involved with the study of history, especially even historical method, actually, you can even see right here for my own book writing project, which I actually don't know if I've told you about, but I have a section on historical method and there's just uh, Church History by James E. Bradley, like me Introduction to Research Method and Resources, uh, Guide to Historical Method by Father Gilbert Garrigan, The Killing of History by Keith Winshuttle, and a really nice one on writing history from Herodotus to Herodian, which is literally just a florilegium of quotes from ancient historians about how to actually do history. Uh, and so <clears throat> being the man who loves history and historical method and proper procedure, treating history as a science himself, that's why your book in particular appeals to me. Now, I love I love my polemical books as well. I've got I've got a bunch of those as well, whether physically or uh, in hard copy, because I'm uh, sorry, or in digital copy. Because in the end, even if they're polemical, they can have plenty of great information to use, and it can just be a fun read. But the greater interest for me is really works that are just trying to be okay. Let's actually look at history as it is. Let's treat it fairly, and so. That's why I'm in particular uh, very much appreciative of your book and some others that try to do something similar, at least on other issues. Because honestly, works that just try to give an honest history of the papacy, like because there are works out there that <clears throat> are aiming to be a sober scholarly uh, history of the papacy. They, they do exist out there, but they're largely just in the, um, uh, in the scholarly, more general realm, they're not really interested of in being in the apologetic sphere. Whereas your book, um, given the spheres that we're interacting with, it, your book is within the apologetic sphere, at least where it's being popularized, but it's trying to bring in that external, sober historical account into it. And so that's, that's something that's actually very unique about the book, not just how you're writing it, but even, uh, especially even just with the unique information, which not many people know of, but even just who you're actually positing the book to. They don't often get this kind of treatment. So that's what I really do like about it. And so in, in light of that, as the approach of your book of being history first, apologetic second, how therefore should we approach the question itself? Well, here's the wrong way. The papacy is wrong. We need to show that it is, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's not how we do history in this. I was kind of referring to before, 
that demands swimming in the papal current anyway. So if I were a polemicist, I wouldn't even want to take that approach. It's going to work against me, I think, right? And um, for this reason, I actually, here's one of my hot takes. I think a lot of orthodox apologists are actually crypto papists because they, they enjoy the syllogisms used the polemics and the eternal logic from medieval papacy. And I think that's why they kind of prefer that approach. Um, but that's not the only wrong way, you know. Like another wrong way could be my brand of X ecclesiology is correct, and I want to cherry pick X in the scriptures and early church history, you know. And so this is more common, no offense, I surprised the audience, but like Baptist and Presbyterian treatments of church history, in my opinion. Um, this that's why I think historically the, the strongest church historians have been Orthodox, Anglican, and Roman Catholic, because at least they're dealing with actually trying to um defend the, and attack tradition in the early church. Um but even those um, communions as well could tend towards that way if they're not taking a holistic approach towards the sources, you know, not admitting weaknesses in their case and different things like that. So I, I deliberately try avoiding this in writing my book. Um, now, like as examples of this to show that, like, you know, I'm being an equal opportunity hater, um, I critique second millennium orthodox canon law. You know, this is something where if you study the history and then you look at what Orthodox canon law is in the second millennium, um, you go that there's, you know, some potential problems with this. You know, I mean, as an apologist, you know, I could try to resolve these, but they're, they are problematic, at least on the surface. And it's something where I'm transparent about this and I'm not hiding it. I'm not, you know, oh, no. Um, Pastor Ortlund or Pastor, Pastor Jason Wallace are going to go make a expose video about orthodoxy using information I found. Again, the person doing research needs to bring out the information and then let the you know chips fall where they may. Um, because again, if we're Christians and believe in the truth, we really shouldn't be that afraid of whatever the truth is. Um, like another thing that I got into some hot water and thank God for my publisher. They let me get away with a asterisk in one part of the book, um, is I conclude that the Apostle Peter is historically, most likely, the literal um, origin of the episcopacy. Now, I think the book makes a very strong case with this. Um, I will at some point have a debate with an Orthodox uh, intercluder against this. And as an Orthodox Christian, I, I suppose I am uh, obviously willing to be convinced this is not the case, but historically speaking, I think there's a very compelling reason to believe, well, yes, St. Peter is the origin of the Episcopate, and I give a careful case for this. Now, used by the wrong polemicist or by, I can even see Roman Catholic apologists say, look, even an Orthodox writer <laughs> in his book says this. Um, say a lot of that. <laughs> you know, right? Like, you're going to... Let me think a quick aside. Like Eric Yerbeier kind of invented that whole way of apologetics. Well, this, you know, Meindorf admits this, and Luth admits that, and blah, blah, blah. And it's effective, and fair enough. Mm. Um, but th there's there's limits to that, as uh, as uh, Christian Wagner brought up in his his critique of Lofton's book. Like, you know, there's limits to that gotcha methodology, if you want to call it. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah. there's a legitimacy, but there's limits, right? But sadly, I, I do give... Um, fodder to the gotcha apologist because the reality is I think good work, you have to be transparent about the stuff and go where the evidence is. And so that is a case that is made in this book. Um, you know, it's another thing I do, which I think if Roman Catholics read the Ignatian corpus, like I read it, they uh, would be making way stronger cases. Is I have a very pro-papal, if you want to put it that way, um, take, I think you would be actually in profound disagreement um, of St. Nish's letter to the Romans. Um, I actually think it's the strongest pro-papal document until you get to the Decretum Galassianum in the 6th century. So that's pretty big words. I mean, and that's a very early text, the early 2nd so century. Um, his statement on uh, Rome presiding in love, I presume, that's doing a lot of heavy lifting there. It's doing a lot of heavy lifting, but there's actually more than there's certain genre things in Ignatius. Like when he gives an honorific, it's actually a trope in his text. He gives honorifics, but the honorifics point to something very obvious, right? So like in his letter to the Ephesians, the honorifics all about predestination, <laughs> which is very <laughs> interesting. 
<laughs> you know, because the Ephesians, the, the epistle to the Ephesians is all about predestination. So you can't yeah. just be like, oh, these are just grand words, because the grand words, Ignatius makes a, uh, he makes a habit of using these honorifics and high sounding things to actually point to things that were well acknowledged. And so my point is, it, it's it's something well acknowledged about Rome presiding over the love feast, which is, you know, the whole church. There's a definite article. Um, I've seen no Roman Catholic source take uh, a position as strong Ignatius. I've been that he's in the audience. I'll, I'll, I'll mention it. John Calarafi doesn't hide this stuff, let's say, in his book, for example, but he doesn't give – it's less narrative focus and, and doesn't give evaluations as much of the, of the sources. He lets the reader give the evaluations. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not quite as coy as a historian. I do give evaluations. I think it's a very strong text. Uh, being that I have a Protestant audience here before they – lose their minds, um, I do give the opinion that there's limitations to how far we could press these words here uh, about Rome, simply because he also writes to Polycarp's church to send, which is in Smyrna, to essentially send bishops to a synod to reconstitute the episcopacy back in Antioch. So this wasn't something that like Rome did in isolation. All right, mm -hmm. my book gets into the details, but the point is the fact that I even get into this shows that I'm not trying to show fall charity. Like this is actually a, a critical look at the history that sometimes forces us to take uncomfortable conclusions, I think. Um, now, I think like, you know, to be fair, like uh, Eric Gerbauer's book, he'll look at the same thing you're looking at Ignatius said. So there's just not enough here mm. uh, to draw a conclusion. And, you know, so, I bring that up because I one disagree and two shows you that I even go farther than your buyer with some of this stuff. Yeah, it's and a bit of a weird role reversal here. We've kind of en entered into the upside down at this point. <laughs> yeah, so it's interesting. Like your buyer starts like almost no papacy early on, and then he, like by the fourth century he smacks you with it. Oh, it's you know, it's having having everything. having read much of the book, he kind of um, and and I, and I do enjoy it for what it is. He kind of goes um, first Clement. It's too too vague and be interpreted in many ways. Ignatius, same diff. Irenaeus, a bit more interesting, but still can be interpreted in many different ways. And then he gets to Cyprian. Boom. Okay, this is some big stuff. Oh, and, and just for people where my coverage of Cyprian makes his interpretation of Cyprian literally impossible. <laughs> Ooh, I, I, I've read everything Cyprian ever wrote, and there's no way in the planet to take a Vatican and ecclesiology applied to Cyprian. You just aren't understanding Cyprian. You're quote mining him. We'll definitely discuss some more of that later. In the so, program. yeah, it's it's so, so again, I start where it looks like very strong, right? Clement taking an appeal, you know, um, Ignatius, you know, acknowledging um, the Bishop of Rome to be their bishop, I argue, all right? You know, and that's an interpatriarchal document. It's between Antioch and Rome. And so people are aware it's the difference between Rome writing to one of its, you know, subservient Episcopacy somewhere in the West versus Rome writing to Antioch or Alexandria or Alexandria writing to Rome is different. I call that the former intra-patriarchal, meaning Rome to a local church. And inter-patriarchal is a term I use for between the different patriarchates. Mm -hmm. All right. And so <clears throat> that's why I can't underscore enough. Like, you know, with St. Ignatius, it's something where I'm surprised that Roman Catholic apologists don't make more hay out of it. I just don't think they've looked closely enough at it. But on the other hand, it's that being said, I don't just stop with one text. I continue following the history, looking impartially and, and as much as I can in my power. And you start finding where it's just a utter avalanche of a conciliar consensus-based ecclesiology versus a non-existent. You don't even see it in the sources um, mm. that it's ecclesiology. It's just not there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes good sense. So we're trying yeah. to, so you're trying to start a, pretty much just as you said before, history first, apologetics second. And so derived from that, you don't want to start with that presupposition. Papacy is wrong. You want to start with just, okay, let's just wipe this slate claim. What does the history actually say? Which yes. again, that's, that's another reason why your book heavily appeals to me. Cause that's something I've, even, even if my online polemics can maybe give the opposite impression, that's how I try to do my studies of these issues, at least in the background. And I do try to um, give that attitude off at least a bit where 
I can't presuppose going into an issue, they're wrong, here's why. Because at that point, what I always tell myself is, well, if you're going into a matter and you're starting with the presupposition that they're wrong and you should figure out why, well, you've effectively sur surrendered the whole endeavor of searching for truth, at which case, why are you even doing any of this? So if you're not going to let the truth be as it is, regardless of what you think, then you may as well just give up, be a, be a, be a hedonist, get all the girls, get all the money, all that jazz. There's, there's no point in you engaging in this unless you have some Machiavellian kind of ulterior motive. Um, but yeah, in any event of, uh, in any event of that, uh, it's good. It, it shows uh, even just with you uh, giving a more pro people reading of certain texts like Ignatius, even that can show, well, Hey, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm fine with this stuff because in the end I'm not threatened by the truth. The truth is what it is. I can't uh, ignore it. And even though I do disagree with that kind of a reading of uh, Ignatius, even that for me, it's not because, oh, no, the papacy can't be true, so it must be something else. I just genuinely think, um, look, it could, it, it's theoretically possible that you can interpret it that way, but there's multiple other equally plausible interpretations. And, and personally, I think uh, my, my more likely interpretation has been a while, but I've read it kind of as uh, more that uh, more of a local over Rome itself, the city or, or Italy writ large, that he's speaking of that kind of presidency of the Church of Rome. Um, but in any case, if it was more clear, if he did end up saying, say, for example, who presides over the whole universal church in love, I'd be like, well, hey, I don't, it doesn't matter if I like that or not. That's there. Can't ignore it. Can't, uh, can't cope around it either. I, I I will say though I think your your reading where it's about the local church would be redundant because he already says earlier in the sentence he presides over Rome so why would he say it twice but it's uh there there's I'm not gonna argue too much with the guy that's reading it word for word in the in the Koine Greek <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, yeah exactly man you want you might want but, <laughs> but I think we can agree on this it's like the last eighteen months Lofton has a book Ibarra has a book Timmy Flanders has come out of the book. What we don't need this is is a is another polemical book, all right. And I find it interesting that at least among the Eastern Orthodox and the Anglican apologists or any Protestant apologists, there really has not been a, an answer to their challenge, right? And which honestly is because people haven't had a strong answer. Um, I heard Ubi Petrus is going to be responding, um, I think uh, chapter by chapter against Edgar Byers. So this is. Just starting, so I guess you know it's. Uh, we'll, we'll have to see what comes of that, but um, ultimately, uh, what I have here, unlike response videos, is not a work of apologetics. This is a work of serious history because I mm -hmm. think the correct way to answer this question of papacy is to set out from the earliest sources with the strongest emphasis on the scriptures because they are the bedrock of the sources. What the ecclesiology of the church was. I think that's what we have to set out to do. And the reason I care about this, because I care about actual history. I mean, I think um, I think it's better to start with, like you were referring to, what's actually there instead of, you know, orthodoxy is right or Anglicanism is right and Roman Catholicism has to be wrong. Um, but I think it's weird that no one really takes this approach. You know, I'm not, it's, I'm not aware of a book that, approaches this topic like this because even like again like i was referring to before the books that are let's say against the papacy or ambivalent the papacy like like chadwick it's they have different concerns it's not about really what's there it's about well how do we explain the schism and stuff like that um mm. and i think it's it's one of those like super obvious things like in the movie national treasure when he says the it was there the whole time when he finds out the very end and they open the whole big thing it's like it's in plain sight. And if we only approached mm. this history from the earliest sources and let that create the narrative, right? The scriptures mm. and what comes right after them and create the narrative from the earliest sources on is to take the narrative from the present and importing it to the past. Mm. What, what we find mm. is that the issue is not merely Episcopal. It's, it's that of Christian consensus. This is both ecclesiastical and epistemic. We, we find that the jurisdictions of the church all revolve around who evangelized which apostle a given territory and where they died. And due to there being no universal territory, there's just no universal papacy, right? It's mm. so it's like right from the beginning, you just you without getting to the whole Vatican one categories of thoughts, you just go from what you have from the early sources, you just you see it's just not there. It can't be because you're letting the narrative be formed by what the earliest sources, particularly the scriptures, say. Um 
One thing the scriptures get less into, but the earlier sources do, is that due to relics and consensus, we have a conciliar system that doesn't develop but exists right from the onset. Um, I think that's an interesting difference between, let's say, an Orthodox take and Protestant takes, because the sola scriptura view of the Protestants obviously would almost look at take an approach to ecclesiology that looks at the scriptures fairly in isolation. I don't want to get to the sola solo scriptura. I, I, I will say not 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 necessarily quite. Um, that's probably more so with the with the reformed, especially even at the beginning with the Reformation, where the the continental classical reformed. They tend to be more critical of uses of the of the fathers and tradition and what have you, rightly so. And the Anglicans and the Lutherans were too, but with the Anglicans and the Lutherans, and particularly the Anglicans, there was actually a legitimate place for the nature of church consensus. Like case in point, if there is a if there is like a negative consensus where on a particular question, literally it's demonstrable that literally everybody across the whole church from the very beginning up until the present. Um, they all held on an important matter, one opinion and not this other opinion, which emerges later. That's basically demonstrable proof that it's a novelty and not to be believed as something of it. So I will, I will uh, add that in defense of my people, <laughs> but anyway, well, there's no point wants to attack you people. Um, <laughs> and it's okay. When he say my people, it's okay, but I say you people, there's something wrong. With you. <laughs> yeah. You people. <laughs> the, uh, so but I think overall, like as a result of this approach, like as some of the commenters said, it's like how we should be approaching the scriptures. We don't have to thoroughly deconstruct the sources because mm. with this approach, the answers are in plain sight, mm. right? I mean, it's the honest read of the book, agree or disagree, Orthodox or Catholic, Protestant. I, I don't think anyone with 110,000 words, it's not that burdensomely long of a book. So 350 pages and there's pictures in the middle and whatnot, you know? They're going to say this is the most in-depth, thorough treatment of the question they've read. And it's really not that long. And that shouldn't even be possible. So how, how did that happen? And, you know, I, the hack code is this different approach. It's you let the earlier sources create the narrative. And that's the hack code to, I think, unlocking the whole first millennium history. Yeah. Um, it makes what is in the sources plainly state of what they plainly say available to us and accessible to us. And so now when we look at old sources of Pope colored glasses, we find that it requires lots of rationalization, lots of categorization, a lot of anachronistic methodological approaches. And as a result, the books become absurdly long or have to lack a lot of details because they need to add a lot of space because they're Pope colored glasses. But it would be for any colored glasses, anything anachronistic. Mm. Um, now, I, I guess I'd just leave it there. Some people know, sadly, after the first century and second century church history, you, it sort of just becomes history of book about the fathers. The, the scriptures weigh in less heavily because the you know the narrative keeps progressing through yeah. through history. Um, but I do think you need that bedrock. It has to start in the scriptures. Has to start in the early sources. Hundred percent true. Hundred percent true in that light. I think the better analogy of just how these things are really clear. Um, than the national treasure analogy. Uh, have you seen? Uh, oh, there's nothing short? better than that analogy. You don't say that. No, no, no. I'll, I'll beg to differ. Have you seen the Big Short? The what short? The Big Short about um 2015 movie about some guys who predicted the global financial crisis. It, fantastic movie, except for some not so uh, not so. Oh, the anti-Semitic stuff or whatever. No, 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 no. Just more like <laughs> revealing, if you will. But in any case, um great movie uh it's like a dark it's a dark comedy basically but really insightful about the global financial crisis and the very beginning scene um because unlike with national treasure he says it, it was right under us all along but like in fairness they had to actually like literally dig and find things and all these puzzle pieces and what have you but with the big short at the very opening scene it describes that um everyone was asleep at the wheel with the banking system and they were they were basically driving into a massive crisis but a few guys um, who saw the crisis coming, they did what no, in the movie's own words, they did what nobody else did. They looked. So they literally just looked at the data that was before them. And that's how they could foresee the crisis. It wasn't anything esoteric. It was publicly available stuff and they just had to connect the dots. So that's, I have to 100% agree. That's how, um, that's how the history of, well, really any topic, but in, in this case, particular, the papacy, that's how that really works is it is just a matter of, just look 
just just look at the data. Don't don't blab your mouth over the data as you're reading it. Just shut up and just let it speak to you. So I have to 100% agree with that take uh, on your part. And, and I think there's yeah. there's just too much of a temptation where people they're looking for validation for preconceived notions. And or if you want that, it's a psychological thing. But that's you can't do history that way. Absolutely not. And if you want to do good history, you absolutely don't do that. Yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. Now, in your book, you have you highlight a very interesting quote, which I love quite a bit, almost as much. Well, okay, second to uh, your your constant citation of uh, of uh, the truth, Iraq. But <laughs> you bring up the quote: uh, "Believe facts rather than words." What is this? What are you trying to convey with that in your book? Now, like Saint Pope Gregory the Great was, you know, everyone was accused of stuff with all these political subterfuges and whatnot. And so people were making accusations against him, right? And he he just wrote back, believe facts rather than words. Like, don't believe the accusations, you know, don't believe the allegations, believe the facts. And so I think anyone who would uh, respond to a false accusation would think that makes sense, obviously, right? Mm. And so in the same way, like when it comes to history do we just believe what people say or how good it sounds no we got to believe the facts and so i think that's a very basic historical methodology but people like well how do we actually do that and so let me unpack that a tiny bit now like the scientific method right you don't just make a theory and go sounds good that's correct like no offense i'm just now you know apologist mind on for a moment but like you get like Roman Catholics like make an argument for the papacy. There has to be a visible, you know, um, a visible a priori, you know, philosophizing arguments. Yeah. You know, yeah. Like, like there has to be a visible principle of unity. And so there must be a pope because that sounds good. But like, <laughs> well, does that really mean anything? The scriptures say this, does tradition say this? Like, where, I mean, that sounds great, but like, what's that even really mean? Right. Hmm. So, we can't just go with what's most fitting, right? Like we actually have to see, like with a theory, it's not like evolution sounds good, I believe in evolution or whatever, right? Like it actually has to be empirically proven, right? That's that's how we verify science. So with historical inquiry, we can make theories based on historical source material on the archeology, span with the archeology, span you know, probably meant um, and whatnot, but how do we test the theory? The, the test is how historical actors apply the words, mm -hmm. right? So that's really not that complicated. The people who write the history, their actions offer for us the interpretation. This is something I've been saying for years. I don't know why this doesn't get through people's heads. It's a very basic empirical approach, but the history. Um, so like if a Vatican I Roman Catholic or a, a low church Baptist or a congregationalist ecclesiology is never actually applied in any historical source, doesn't matter if it's mentioned or sounds like it or the good and fitting consequence of the words would make us think that's the right thing to do. If it's never actually applied by anyone who wrote anything, it didn't exist. You know, that that, that would be the empirical test, but in historical uh, with historical conclusions. So I think what we can do is take an unproven theory and because whether you think it sounds great or not, the visible principle of unity or whatever, put that above how we actually look at history, right? Um, the historian should devise a theory that works with the application. This scientifically um, is the soundest way to derive conclusions. Yeah, 100% agree with that. Now, with that said, let me throw you a little bit of a curveball because I 100% agree with that principle, belief facts rather than words. Um, you've got to actually take into account what the fathers and councils and what have you actually did and not just what they said about Rome. Um, and that's something that I think was extremely helpful. Well, it's extremely helpful in my own studies of the issue and also even in my uh, in my debates on the matter with others. But um, is it nonetheless possible that uh, that uh, there can be situations where some father says one thing and then they do something and it's not that the thing that they do interprets or contextualizes what they said, but that it actually is an inconsistency. And, and the most modern examples would be with various quite famous Roman priests and clergy, what have you, uh, Bishop Strickland, Father Altman, and others, who 
prior and, and indeed it's, it's part of their as far as i'm aware it's part of their their, their oaths as um as 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 roman clergy uh that they are fully supportive of like papal supremacy this that principle of unity um but then suddenly their later actions everyone is seeing and, and acknowledges that it actually kind of goes against it the way that they're resisting the pope so i would ask you how would you to detect um for situations uh where either the father says one thing and then they they do an action that contextualizes it and, and and they're compatible it's just a matter of context versus a situation where they say one thing and then they do another thing but they're really in conflict how would you detect the difference in is what i'm asking well at first i want to concede the point where obviously stuff like that can really happen with human actors because the reality is we're not human history doesn't play out in a controlled scientific environment. That's why like in an empirical test, there's a controlled environment, there's control groups, right? They're trying to control for factors yeah. that could bias or alter the results, the, the testing of a theory. We don't really have that in history. What we have instead is pretty much two things. One would be just like the burden of sources, how many weigh in on a question and there's a certain point where, well, not all of them could be acting this way and all of them just be acting against words and, and thereby their words don't have that meaning, right? Like uh, imagine if on every single thing, people say one thing and do another, right? It, I guess if we're that predictable, we would just say, all right, whatever someone says, the exact opposite's what they meant. <laughs> <laughs> Usually the opposite's the case. And so I think it would be safer to say, you look at most circumstances and look at what's happened the majority of the time, would be the most accurate way of interpreting the meaning of words. I mean, that, that'd be the thing that makes the most sense. Um, the, the second thing is skipping my mind at the moment, um, but I'm trying to think. I can't remember. <laughs> right, right, yeah. So I basically just that. seeing how the patterns actually lay out. Um, oh, oh yeah, that's the second thing is just context, obviously, right? So someone is a liar. Like, for example, Pope Vigilius is on the record a, a liar. He goes back and forth lying. Or someone is a liar. Anastasius Librarian, he's just a, a known liar. Um, you know, if these things exist, then we, what we try to find out is, all right, what is the motive for the lie? Or what's the motive for the truth even, right? Mm -hmm. And... That's why historians often look for motives for actions. Um, that's mm. that comes out a lot in this book is where I, you know, we look at well, what's the motive for this or what's the motive for writing this? Because sometimes that's relevant to interpretation. So that'd be the other thing. So like uh, with all the modern stuff with, with Roman Catholicism, um, I think motives give a lot of reason for why things happen as they do, and mm -hmm. even why even the liberals within the Roman Catholic Church word things in such a way they do. Like he, If you've noticed, the sort of weasel words Pope Francis will use, where you know he means something heretical, but he just dances around it. So that way he has plausible deniability. And so, well, there's an obvious motive for that, because he wants to have an agenda, but have his cake and eat it too, and, and not pretty much give all Roman Catholics a reason just to give up and say, you know, this stuff is made up, you know. Um, and so I think that motive also plays a role. It's you almost have to be a little bit like a detective when you're reading sources, um, but it shouldn't obviously edge towards conspiratorial or something where you're nothing means what it means because you're looking for motives everywhere that are intangible. Obviously, that's that's ridiculous. Yeah, hundred yeah, percent have to agree with that. I think the probably the locus classicus case study of this of discerning whether a father's actions and words really are compatible and thus they contextualize each other or if they're really being inconsistent with their actions and words locus classicus would have to be cyprian and so that's something we'll definitely discuss a, a little bit later because as far as i'm aware uh eric abara he actually does posit a bit of an inconsistency with what cyprian says at one place about the place of rome versus his actions later with with stephen but We'll get to that and, when we and, uh, Yeah, and I'd argue that comes from an incomplete reading of Cyprian. When you actually read him as completion, you actually could see what those other things are talking about. But right. I'll leave that yeah. there. And yeah, we'll we'll definitely get there soon because that's what I'm genuinely interested in. Now, in light of all, all of this, in light of this big study that you've done with your diehard focus on look, let's just be historical, let's just let the sources speak for themselves, let the let the sources construct their own narrative 
Don't come at it like a uh, like a non self reflecting, non self conscious postmodernist who complains about people bringing their own uh, bringing their own uh, frames on things only to impose their own frame on it. And let the sources themselves build the framework. In light of all that, what are some of the surprising conclusions that people would not expect that you've come to with this book? Well, one and, and it, some of this obviously right because I'm the writer and I talk some about this stuff before the book was written. But like the Easter controversy, for example, wasn't about Easter. It's about jurisdiction. Mm. You know, still unsure I mean, about that one. <laughs> it's. I, Let's have a debate on it, man, because it's just, <laughs> you know, the, the interesting thing is out of all stuff, and the, and the book gives some of the reasons about relics and blah, blah, blah. I was just randomly reading. Um, it's a brand new book on, say, Denisius Areopagite. And ironically, it's actually, I have an interview with the author tomorrow, the author and translator of the book. And uh, what comes out if you read, um, the actual life of the saint, there is details given in passing about um, the role of relics and with Rome's uh, disputed jurisdiction with ours, right? Apparently, for example, St. Tropimus, I want to get his name right. He's one of the lesser of the apostles. He's mentioned in Acts of the Apostles, right? So he's a biblical character. According to tradition, he brought the gospel all the way to Gaul. And... So people will read Denny's papalism, right? Because there's nothing really about relics in that book. They'll read Denny's papalism and they see like almost like Adolf Leo the Great with the, with the strong arm of the Roman emperor making himself dictator of Gaul and determining what all the bishops could do in France. And, you know, and Hilary of Arles is fighting against him. And, so, and, and it's kind of like, pose like, you know, David versus Goliath and whatnot, because again, that very polemical approach to history. But what does like a first millennium source look at this episode? It looks at, it actually cites letters that were written from Arles over Tro, over Tropomius and his, uh, I'm hoping get his name right. It starts with TRO. I have to look at my notes, but over his relics, right? That they had the right to appoint the metropolitan there and to appoint bishops there and not the Bishop of Rome. Why? Because they were evangelized by an apostle. But if they weren't evangelized by an apostle, then theoretically, the Saint, Saint, the inheritor of St. Peter and Paul, because they do have an apostolic throne, could appoint bishops there because they otherwise would have evangelized it. But if an apostle evangelized there and not someone from Rome, that means Rome doesn't have rights to appoint locally a bishop there. So we can already see that the narrative that we get from anything second millennium that you're thinking about is totally unsatisfactory to understand something like the Easter controversy. Mm -hmm. Because for one, they're looking at, well, is there universal jurisdiction, which like just because a bishop of Rome thinks he can appoint a bishop somewhere in France has nothing to do with universal jurisdiction. But two, then we look at what people are actually arguing about when these things are happening. They're arguing about, but no, we had an apostle. So we appoint the bishops here, even though he was mm -hmm. a lesser apostle. Mm -hmm. So there's this whole other ecclesiastical presumption at work that none of the apologists talk about. None of the historians are talking about, but it's in all the sources. Someone's got to talk about it. Sadly, that guy's me. And, and, the, and the more I'm reading, I'm starting to find like there's more and more being translated by Docythia's second Jerusalem he wrote in the 16 and 1700s. You start finding like guys like him talked about it. It's just not talked about in the English language. It's not in the Western discourse. I've become the guy who's taken this stuff and put it into the English language discourse. And so it starts becoming like uh, this cavalcade of evidence when you get into stuff from the third century, stuff from the second century, that Easter controversy really wasn't about Easter. It was about jurisdiction. So it's uh, that's one of the conclusions I do draw. And, it, and the more I read, even after writing the book, it just the more stuff I find that really points to it. Oofed. Okay. Other conclusions? Well, uh, baptism controversy, which is a controversy for Orthodox, between Orthodox, Orthodox Roman Catholics. I don't even know if you guys care so much, honestly. <laughs> but like it's, I've read in all the sources like Chadwick and stuff. It's like kind of like big old strong Pope Stephen versus everyone else. And, you know, Pope Stephen was being a meanie. And it's like, uh, but like Cyprian was kind of crazy with his baptism ideas. 
But if you actually like look at all the extant sources, which I don't know, it wouldn't take you that long. Take you like a week of reading. It's not that much. You read everything Cyprian never wrote. You write everything uh, Dynasties of Alexandria ever wrote. It's like you're, it's not like that much sources have survived. It's not going to take you two hours, but you know, it, it's not like an impossible PhD dissertation for you to read. Um, you find out it's Rome. Egg, Rome had egg on their face during this. They were wrong. They even changed their mind. They they changed what Pope Stephen was doing under Pope Dionysius, and they made their policy match Alexandria's. Like, where do you hear that? But it's plainly in the sources, staring right at you in the face. You you could read Dionysius' letter to uh, in Eusebius, where he flat out says that I wrote to Din Dionysius and Philemon about this. And obviously, Dionysius isn't talking about writing to himself. He's talking about Dionysius of Rome, who formerly had the view of Stephen. And so he says they changed Stephen's view. They formerly had a view. Who became Pope? Dionysius. And so now you start making sense of what really happened here. Um, but I think because people are so invested in the narrative of that there was this like latent papacy or seeds of papacy or Pope Stephen was acting very papal, you know, an aberration or or whatever. And, and Eric Bauer said it wasn't an aberration. That's what it always was. That because people are so caught up in that, they actually miss what it was really about. And when you go into what it's really about, you find out, yeah, Pope, Pope Stephen had uh, a kind of peculiar way of bringing in heretical baptisms, and Rome stopped doing it because he was wrong. And that explains why everyone went against him, because he was wrong. Um, and uh, that's an audience, so I won't, you know, sugarcoat it, um, which would be typical when speaking of a saint. He is a saint in my communion. But historically speaking, that's that's the conclusion you're forced to draw. Yeah, that that one that one caught me off guard quite a bit because I, I hadn't studied the the rebapt the so called rebaptism controversy a whole ton, but I kind of just took for granted the the typical narrative of well, uh, Steve, uh, Cyprian opposed Stephen, so oh, papacy debunked uh, somewhat, um, and uh, but Cyprian was wrong on baptism, so and then, and then kind of both sides were uh, wrong. Oh, yeah. <laughs> then actually, but then actually seeing, uh, having looked at the sources you presented, and seeing, especially by Dionysius of Alexandria, especially that one source where he's like, um, "Well, we've uh, we used to be of Stephen's opinion on baptism, but now we change our mind." And there's multiple other regional churches that disagree, that agree with Cyprian over over Stephen. So seeing that was like, "Oh wow, actually, okay, that's a bit more a bit." larger of an issue than I actually thought. It's not exactly Cyprian contra mundum as it was kind of sold to me. Yeah, no, it's actually the opposite. What people yeah. don't get is they they'll, they'll go, all right. And and you know, you'd see this in maybe like circa 2017 Eric Barra blog posts and stuff like this. So big these appeals to Rome prove they're looking to the Pope of Rome to fix everything in the whole church. But no one ever looks to appeals made outside of Rome or appeals from Rome. It's like somehow they don't count. But yet we see um, in the um, Easter controversy, Irenaeus writes to the world synods against Pope Victor. That's an appeal against Pope Victor's claims, and Pope Victor loses. So we actually have an a, example of an appeal made against Rome. Rome gets overturned. In, in, in the baptism controversy, we know for a fact it's spelled out how Cyprian appealed to Vermilion, obviously got to this to Alexandria, and we find that the Dionysius of Rome then we can't see he changes Rome's policy. And so we see appeals made against Rome, Rome loses. So like, when do you ever hear this? You never hear this. And yet these are the earliest interpatriarchal appeals that exist in history. And Rome lost both of them. And so the whole point is to say, oh, Rome is nothing. That That's actually not the point. It's That's not the point of my book whatsoever. It's to show you that there's this organic uh, ecclesiology that exists in the early church mm -hmm. that doesn't meet people's presuppositions. And, and so if you remove those presuppositions, you can actually kind of see it for what it is. Very good. That's a very good way to take it. Now, um, cause I, I, cause I know um, with how we, uh, with how we scripted this, you have a whole, you have a whole list of conclusions. You want to just and like, you can, you can skip anything you want. I just, I was just giving sure, ideas. So we'll, just, <laughs> we'll, just, we'll just discuss whatever we, sure. We'll discuss whatever we feel yeah, like. Yeah. So like, a quick one, which unless you've got more to say, is like Council Nicaea, right? I mean, this is plainly what the sources say. It wasn't about Pope Rome felt really bad that there was Arianism, and so he made sure they would call a council, and then he he rubber stamped it to go, yep, fixed Arianism. Now what it's about, what they actually talk about. 
an ecclesiology and an epistemology of consensus. That it's literally yeah. what they write about. I had I had yeah. one YouTube commenter say, "What's this democratic stuff that essentially I'm inventing?" I'm like, "So you're faulting me for not taking my people powers and then putting them in the text, but actually reading the word consensus, which is used in the actual text, and, and, <laughs> and I'm taking modern ideas and putting in the text." No, I'm taking the words that are actually there and saying, this is what we ought to be paying attention to. Um, now, I don't want to get too much into epistemology because people like their eyes glaze over. But the fact that the early church had an idea of how they thought they verified truth and, and it applied the consensus means at least historically dealing with the question, we got to talk about this. And mm -hmm. this book talks about it. And then Nicaea talked about it um, in several yeah. texts. Now, yeah. Um, yeah. Um... And and I like that conclusion in particular because it coincides with a little personal area of research, which I want to eventually give in a stream uh, soon. And basically looking at the imperial dimension of the ancient church, because that's something which I believe is incredibly, incredibly neglected in these debates. Like obviously you'll have in the discussions, people talk about, oh, Constantine called this council or hey, the emperor is normally called the councils and whatnot. But beyond that, people don't, but beyond that, people often from all sides don't really stop to think, isn't that kind of significant? In, in a way, in a functional yeah. sense, the emperors were the head of the church in, in the Roman jurisdiction, which was functionally the great majority of the church, at least for at least for a while. And so I've been kind of focusing on this concept I like to call the imperial magisterium, where yeah. to a great degree... Um, actually the, the the functional in a functional sense not in terms of like oh well by divine power christ rested the authority of the church with the emperor of rome no 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 but rather by 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 function uh, de facto power the emperors were the head of the church they largely called the shots and if they didn't get their way with certain bishops they would either um they would either be try to be at least a little bit diplomatic at first like uh like theodosius the first for example where he called that council with other heretics to try and persuade them and then he eventually banished them when they didn't agree <laughs> or or you would or in many other cases if they disagree with bishops and thought they were teaching heretics they'd have no issue with just deposing him including popes including popes of rome multiple times yeah it's um from his from a historical way it's kind of bizarre you go from you know people in their lifetime right you're in the year 300 being persecuted by the by the caesar your religion's illegal and then 40 years later you're letting the Caesar decide what legally could be taught or not taught in your churches. Yeah. It, makes, it makes no sense, right? Yeah. And, um, and, then, and then it persists like that, let's be honest, until like the Enlightenment, because yeah. the vestiges of that continue in all the monarchies of the West. It continues in the Byzantine Empire. It continues in, um, in the Russian Empire. Um, and it effectively continues in the Ottoman Empire because essentially the, the ecumenical patriarch is turned into like the ethnarch of the Christian peoples within that empire. And it really has nothing to do with Christianity. The only thing I'm surprised is how little the sources try to conflate the emperor with like King David and stuff. You think they'd at least try. Thank God they didn't from my perspective. <laughs> yeah. You know, uh, thank God I can't speak for Western sources, but it doesn't really come up in the Orthodox tradition. Mm. Yeah. Um, that like somehow the Byzantine emperor became like a prophet king of some sort. In fact, uh, <laughs> that that is cited by one of the iconoclast emperors, and it's explicitly denounced by Saint Germanus and Pope Gregory the Second. Second, yes. So it's like when push came to shove, when that actually was full blown, like yeah, I am like King David. Like no, no, you're not. And so even within a very imperial church, it never fully capitulated to that insane idea because effectively it almost did as you observe. And it's it's kind of mind-boggling. I'll, I'll just add, because I, I would love to get more into that stream, because I think that's such an interesting topic. I'll just add this one tidbit, which is kind of like the same reason Hitler started killing um, the, uh, the disabled, and then the Roman Catholics in Germany made such a hubbub, even in dictatorship, Hitler had to stop. Right. So it would be kind of untrue to say whatatever Hitler said went, because it actually is yeah. not real history. I mean, Hitler did yeah. a lot of bad stuff. But the reality is, if only the Germans spoke up about more stuff, he would have done less bad stuff. Right. So the consent of the people means something even in a dictatorship. And we find that in church history, the we'd have emperors push heresies. And ultimately, those heresies 
would not prevail because the church would just keep pushing against it. And then, of course, once it became the accepted, then anything against the Orthodox thing became persecuted. So it's sort of like it kind of takes the glamour out of the church organically dealing with something like Caesar or papism because then the, the Caesar then, okay, now I'm down with it. And, and then it changes everything. Um, from a Protestant perspective, obviously, this is what you have with icons, right? <laughs> um, you have the doctrine of icons, and then it just becomes pretty much imposed, and that's it. That becomes tradition, because East and West, that becomes the imposed idea. Um, if it were not true that this was the actual consensus teaching the church, then what you would have is essentially an imposed false doctrine. Um, so it's uh, it's something that isn't really talked enough in the history, because I think most people reading the history, if you're looking at, you want to look at quaint people getting along, doing not so political stuff, this is not the history for you because the real history is kind of dirty. The saints play dirty sometimes. It's just the facts. Yeah. Um, they were in a very dirty system. Um, but actually, my last comment would be, it's too easy to be like an atheist and then dismiss all of it because like there's this nice little short history of the early church. It'd be good for like a teenager um, it's written by a Roman Catholic author. I'd, ha I'd have to pull it out. I reviewed it years ago in Reason and Theology. I really like it because he made this really good point, which was, you know, when the Arians went into Rome and they sacked Rome, they didn't sell everyone to slavery. It's like, but if they were pagans still, they probably would have. So it's like, at least under Christianity, the, the corruption became less chauvinistic. <laughs> right? It was less. <laughs> So we have to see it for what it is. There were problems, but they would have been more profound, obviously, if we're dealing with out and out pagans. Yep, hundred percent. Have to agree with that. Have to agree. And to move to a topic which is quite related to this, um, both this topic and with the sources I'm studying, and one which really fascinates me, especially in light of my uh, debate with Pine Sap, because this is a big thing that I focused on there. Which you well, I could have pressed more on it. The <laughs> that we'll look at now the Miletian schism so or actually what you call and which I'm actually quite warm to in fact I, I probably want to start calling that now just because the facts more or less bear that out the Roman, Roman schism, schism. As it that's what called. it is yeah everyone was in a communion with Miletius other than yeah. Rome and Rome was a community everyone was on the Miletius there's a certain point where it's silly and essentially the Roman emperor poses this to the Roman city as silly, and they're like, all right, we'll stop now. Yeah. Um, now, if you get into the weeds, especially early 5th century popes, they, they write much more muscularly on this topic and not look so weak. But the, the reality is, is that a whole ecumenical council was held kind of in defiance of Rome. Um, Rome accepted its canons. Why? This is Constantinople one. Because there was a deal made. You don't read this in any other apologist source, but it's, you know, scholarship. I didn't invent this. Um, there was a deal made where um, Malatius and Paulinus, which were the, the, the opposing bishops with claims to Antioch, excuse me, Episcopacy, um, that whoever died first, uh, would their followers would lose the, the claim to be patriarch, and the next guy would be the real legitimate patriarch. It, it was a fine deal. Malatius agreed to it. Uh, Flavianus, the next bishop of Antioch, also agreed to it. Of course, Paulinus agreed to it. It was brokered by the Pope of Rome. That was says, um, Constable 1 happens. Um, I think a good reason to believe that canons, at least 1 through 4, are from the year 381 is because the West accepted them, unlike canons 5 through 7. Because what happens right after the Council of Constable 1? Malatius died. All right. So he dies in 381. So that's so canons one through four have to be from 381 because the West accepted. By the way, that includes canon two, which is a big thing in this book. Um, so anyway, or canon three. Now, that being said, um, Flavianus breaks the oath and allows himself to be appointed the bishop of Antioch, and the whole East accepts this. So, of course, like that's that's spitting in, in the West's face. There was a deal broke that everyone agreed to it. Right. And so this creates a the schism resumes. So, right. So there's a schism. They accept Malatius and Paulinus. And then the schism resumes. Um, and long story short, eventually, Alexander is all right. We're in communion with Antioch. Everyone's a communion with Antioch. Um, no one cares about Paulinus' successor. And finally, Rome relents and goes back to communion with Antioch. So, what's my point in telling the story? Because someone like looking at this in OCD way said, but Antioch was wrong. 
well, they were wrong maybe because they broke that deal, but isn't it kind of wrong to be even posed with that deal when Paulinus didn't have a synod? He had one small building as his church. Yeah. He was not legitimate patriarch. He was not ordained by his synod. Um, patriarchs need the reception of the synod. Um, and so, yes, it shows you that Malatia, uh, the Malatius and then, uh, well, particularly Flavianus, St. Flavianus was a little like, you know, underhanded that he made an oath and didn't owe up to it. But the reality is they were in the right, and Rome eventually conceded to it. And the fact that you could have everyone communion and Rome communion with other people, something that the apologists pretend is impossible, was just plainly what happened. It's in all the sources. Yeah. Um, it's not very confusing. In fact, just so they know, one of the canons of the Council of Carthage in 419 even makes mention of tangential communion. Because at that time, um, Rome was in communion with Carthage, but they were not in communion with Alexandria over St. John Chrysostom. But Carthage was in communion with Alexandria. So this idea, like, Craig made up tangential communion. It's like, dude, you just haven't even read the basic sources on this stuff. It's in all the histories. It's in the canons. Yeah. Um, it's just what happened. Yeah, it, 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 when you don't, when you, well, when you're forced to presuppose the Pope as the principle of unity, when you look at this, the history just doesn't make any sense. You can't really compute a lot of it. When you don't approach with that presupposition, it just is what it is. You have this web of lots of links between churches, communions, and then some broken links between certain local communions, but they're in communion with others who are in communion with others. And then, but then you eventually come to situations that come to a head, like the Roman schism of the, uh, of the late fourth century. And that's why that situation to now, to now, bring the history forward into a little bit of polemics because uh, I think in this situation in particular, it's kind of deserved be just because of how blatant and on its face it is. Like most other conclusions, you kind of have to do um, start with the history and you have to do a little bit more reasoning until you can say, okay, this is why this is a problem for the papacy. But with this situation, it's kind of just on it. It's just really deliberately on its face. You can even, um, you can look at all the relevant sources with it, whether in the Theodosian Code that speaks of who are the bishops and they're in communion with each other at the Council of Constantinople, or you can just look at one line by um, was it Theodosius or the, the emperor who uh, basically Theodore, said Theodore? You're thinking of Theodore's history? Um, yes, I think so. Where the emperor said to Rome straight up, "Look, li quite literally everyone else in the East and even Illyricum in your own patriarchal jurisdiction." is in communion with these guys so grow up and join them <laughs> even that one <laughs> line alone can kind of just point to you like that wasn't an assumption of the church back then that you must be in communion with rome to be in the church all these people were in communion with an episcopate that rome was not in communion with that is like the the only kind of cope i can imagine in response to that would be well maybe the message just didn't travel fast enough for those Eastern churches. Yeah. <laughs> no, it did take decades for Nugus to travel back then. It's yeah, ex <laughs> exactly. It, 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 it was, messages traveled faster than most people realized back then. But in, in any case, that's why in this situation, it, it's kind of, um, it's kind of justified to kind of jump a little quickly into the polemics because it is just an on your face look. That just wasn't an assumption of the church at that time that you had to be in communion with Rome. But can you see how easy it is to look at this topic without the anachronistic Vatican I stuff? Yeah. Right? Yep. Because you just see it for exactly what it is. And um, like in the Orthodox liturgy, we pray for peace between the churches. It's almost a liturgical prayer that wouldn't make sense within Rome because the prayer presupposes there's always these constant frictions and breaks in communion mm. within the churches, but yet there's still a church. Mm. Right? And so, like, this made sense with the ancients, but when we, but in modern ideas, you know, like, it, it's it, it just, I don't know, it frustrates when people are like, well, how could there be an Orthodox church when there's different state churches? Even, like, big apologists like Duong say that. It's like, uh, how can you make, like, uh, and no, Duong said something about uh, the region, you know, there's, how can there be a Georgian Orthodoxy and a Greek Orthodoxy and you know, this and that? Like, how can you have different churches but be the universal church? And it's like, it just doesn't make sense historically. It's like anyone who's just taking historical sources at their word would see how silly that is. The same the deal when people make a big deal about Moscow and Constantinople schism. I mean, that would just be a uh, Wednesday morning for breakfast in the year 395, stuff like this. <laughs> you know, so it's it's just like the even bringing it up shows a profound historical ignorance. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, at that least methodologically, makes... right? Because there's people that bring it up that aren't stupid people, and they've read them. Yeah. But it shows you this. That's why this stream starts about methodology. Mm, you know, yeah. it's their approach to history is really, really wrong, which is why they can't see something that's just plainly there in the sources. Absolutely, method really is everything. Even the most intelligent guy with the wrong method. Well, hopefully, the most intelligent guy will see something that's wrong with a bad method. But an extremely intelligent guy with bad method, that's not going to give good results whereas a guy with a barely average iq with not even a college degree if he has a good method he'll be able to bear a lot more fruit with his own studies than the uh than the scholar and so so that so malaysian no sorry a the three-year-old schism. boy a three-year-old boy knows more about gender than the gender studies uh scholar right because it's the method the method is what determines that so there you go mate honestly i think uh i think a sixth grader knows more than a gender studies professor but in any event that's the Roman schism. That's a big one I've been very interested in since uh, since it was brought to my attention. Now, how about the matter of just the historical fact that numerous popes throughout history, bishops of Rome, were deposed? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> it happens, <laughs> right? It's um, and then, you know, on top of my there was the guy before Vigilius. Uh, oh, he really got a his name at the moment um, Sylvester no. uh, Silverius. Silverius. Silverius so Silverius was deposed um even he appealed to Justinian he's like come on man this is ridiculous and you're Justinian's like this ain't Those right. exact send, words. Send, yeah, come send on. it back to Rome and Vigilius is like no they made me bishop of Rome kicks him back out die, dies in exile he's a Roman Catholic saint I'd say rightly so from their communion because he really really didn't do anything wrong for what happened to him um, but that being said, it's, you have that, um, you have Pope Martin, who's a saint. Um, you have it where his synod appoints a new bishop against his explicit instructions, right? So this idea that the Pope Roma, that buck stops there, well, they went and appointed a new bishop against his explicit, he gave instructions. We have his letter. They, they just disregard it. And we have a letter he wrote while that other Pope's alive and he doesn't acknowledge him as Pope, um, which I bring out in the translation in the Latin. Um, so it's, again, it's in the sources and you could just accept it for what it is if you just read the history. But if you have this idea that, you know, the Pope Rome can't be deposed or, or, or whatever other ideas, like you, you then have to look at that and contrive all these categories of thoughts and really make a lot out of it, which is just not there. Um, the most obvious is Pope Stephen, um, who gets deposed by a synod of all the other patriarchs, which is the... The book show, delineates going all the way back to the first patriarchal deposition, which is of Paul Sevasada. You need all the synods to depose a patriarch. That's how it works. They depose a, a, a Pope of Rome. It, it's what happens. Now, he died very shortly afterwards, but it's this is something that exists in history. Um, another thing that exists that the book gets into is that sometime around the 6th uh, century, it gets invented no one took it seriously, as I argue, right? Because Rome, in the next two centuries, allowed for the deposition of popes. But the point is, the idea was invented that a pope can't be deposed, at least by their own sin, right? Hmm. And so what that leads to is when there's future papal depositions starting in the 8th century, they start not really deposing them for crimes anymore. They start just, like, making up they weren't really ordained. So instead of made-up crimes... Like he slept with my mother or whatever, right? It becomes like made up. He wasn't really ordained. There's only one hand on him at the time, you know, whatever. Um, he didn't, so, he didn't tap his head and rub his belly. <laughs> yeah. So pretty much papal depositions still occur in the West, but they become really like invalidations because of this idea that actually starts in one of the pseudo smacking forgeries. Hmm. And so this is where belief facts rather than words is very important because clearly hmm. – those words didn't mean anything in the sixth and seventh centuries because the uh, the Roman synod accepted papal se- depositions in the sixth and centuries, but they did mean something in the eighth century. And then in the ninth century, it kind of got twisted to be against uh, patriarchal depositions from the whole church, right? So you could actually see when an idea doesn't exist, and then you can see it develop, and then you could see it where it gets completely mutated and used in a Vatican one sort of way. Um, in historical sources. So it's, uh, that's why I think, again, methodology is key. 
very true. And by the way, people, I should have mentioned this earlier, but we will have a QA at the end at the end of this, depending on how long Craig can go for. So shove in your questions, uh, put a night, put a little Q with a colon, and then state your questions so that I know it's a question for the QA. And as usual, super chats and local supporters get priority with the QA. Now, with that said, looking at the other options we have here, because I'm, I'm I'm saving what is, in my opinion, the best for last, and I think you know which one I'm talking about with that. No, I don't, but I'm surprised me. <laughs> come, come, come on, man. Just just tap the neurons together. You probably, you probably know which. We did an entire stream on it, hint, hint. Um, but so I'm going okay. to give one more it. example before that. You're 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 gonna you're gonna think you're so stupid once I actually bring it up. <laughs> uh, I know I'm stupid, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> but um, so one before that, um, you have. Let's talk. Oh, let's like talk about because this is one where we had a. I had a little bit of pushback with you because I I wasn't totally sure with your interpretation of the text, but I think you clarified things for me. Let's talk about. Uh, uh, Pope St. Uh, Pope St. Martin and his okay. alleged denial of direct jurisdiction. Yeah. So like we have a very plain text where if we were to do the Pope minors methodology, believe fact, uh, believe words rather than facts and the conversation would already be over. Right. We have Pope Martin say, it's not in my power to appoint a new patriarch or Jerusalem. I mean, direct jurisdiction, you know, the boots, right. As the kids would say, like, that's it. <laughs> The question now is whether the facts actually align with this. And um, the answer is yes, because the context of the statement makes that clear. Um, Pope Marty wanted to make uh, people understand that they had to work with the present acting patriarch of Jerusalem, which was um, uh, Stephen of Dora, and not right then to disown communion with him and thereby compromise the rebuilding of diatholite holy orders. I mean, that's right there in the letter. Um, and so it's pretty clear. He says, you know, I can't do this. I am not going to be taking this appeal against Stephen of Dora, essentially deal with it. And that's pretty much the letter summed up very shortly. Um, but before people radically decontextualize this and say, like, oh, he didn't physically have the power to do it, and that's what he's talking that's about. Kind of, that's kind of what I said, where it, 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 from my initial reading, it implied I thought it was saying that he just physically did not have the logistical power to set up the patriarch. Well, here's why that's not true, other than the fact that it's just not stated and the stuff I just said was stated. One, Stephen Adora at that time was, like, miles away. Right. So the fact that he's even physically present means in the year 649, when the letter is written, you could get a bishop from Rome and get him to Jerusalem and to the, the, the vicinity. And how do we know? Because that's exactly what Stephen Adora did. It's not a conspiracy. Um, the second thing is the letter is from the Pope of Rome to uh, Pantaleon, a cleric in Jerusalem. So how did the letter get from Rome to Jerusalem if he couldn't get someone physically to Jerusalem, if he couldn't ordain a bishop and send him? That's a good I mean, point. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's, you can't say the Muslims would have stopped them. We have a Roman legate from Rome with the letter, link it to Pantaleon. So the context of the letter itself disproves that reading. It makes it utterly ridiculous. Um, the third thing is with Vatican I ecclesiology, you could appoint bishops in absentia. That's what they did with Alexandria. They never had a they never had a bishop in Alexandria, and they had a patriarch Alexandria until like 1965 or something, right? So the idea that like this doesn't fall falls on Vatican I and they didn't physically have the power doesn't even go by Vatican I ideas because they do have the power. They could do it in absentia. And this is all stuff that didn't happen. Um, and so it's just, honestly, there's just no way to understand what this letter is saying other than what it clearly states. The, the title of the letter aligns, the context around it aligns, what we know um, about where Stephen Adora aligns. Um, the motive for writing the statement and for writing the letter itself aligns with these facts. Everything aligns with it. And so it's that's why I could use that quotable. And it's one of the few quotables um, that really the Orthodox have that's just as strong as those really out of context Roman Catholic ones because it's so short. Because usually the facts are more broad. It's like, think, why? Why? Let's talk why for one brief second. If Vatican I direct jurisdiction didn't exist, why would someone even say, I don't have direct jurisdiction? They have no reason to, right? There's no occasion to deny something that doesn't exist, which is why when people say, well, why can't I find 
anti-papal quotes in the early sources that are against Vatican I. Well, if Vatican I didn't exist, you're not going to expect quotes to exist against Vatican yeah. ideas. Yeah. They would have no occasion to write against it. But in this situation, there was an occasion to talk about why he yeah. couldn't do anything about Stephen Adore and why Pantaleon didn't like right. him. And that's the motive for writing the statement because there's actually a reason for it, mm. right? People that study history understand this stuff. Yeah, it, it's, it's kind of like expecting for someone, uh, expecting for someone to find statements in history about why watching Pokemon is bad because it's witchcraft in the 12th century. It, it's just <laughs> maybe, maybe there's some lost chapter of the of the Summa Theologica that we don't have about it, but ultimately we can have the answers because Pokemon did. Is Trio is that the name of Diglett's evolution? Is that a ty typological for the Holy Trinity? <laughs> Oh dear, no comment. Um, is, 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 is Arceus the uh, typological prefiguring of the Pope? But uh, in, in any case, <laughs> Mewtwo is diathelitism. Ah, uh, yes. And, uh, and Magikarp is uh, Paul of Samosida. I, I don't know. But in any event, <laughs> in any event that, that one, that one interested me a lot when I found it because obviously it's not um, the. The letter itself, I tracked down the, the the book for it. I think you told me where it was, or one of your references was there. Um, and I read it myself, and that's how I was able to interact with it. It's um it's interesting because it gets into the interesting territory where it's not one of it's not in the typical collections or really just collection, the Shafe collection, which has like more or less the monopoly of online open source um uh, translations of the Church Fathers, yeah. at least with some relative completeness. And and that's that's something which actually does affect these debates a lot because oh, yeah. pretty much mm -hmm. all of the major passages debated in the online spheres, especially in the popular level, but even sometimes in the more niche theobro channels like us, almost all the chat, almost all the passages we have are those which are readily available in the Shave Collection, um, and, and that's kind of an issue because now you're missing out on a lot of texts which are only available in. Um, maybe common, but still you have to buy them type sources like the Fathers of the Church series or even more niche sources which don't even have a translation in a popular series yet, case in point, the letters of Pope Martin here. And so you have to go to particular scholarly works uh, that have those. And, and that's more or less what I did, what I am doing rather with my research on the Imperial Magisterium where I've got the a copy of the translation of the Theodosian Code, which is not exactly available easily. And yeah. even in there, mm -hmm. I, I, sent, I sent you recently what is basically something that could easily be used as a papal proof text, but just no one uses it because so few people are willing to actually go to sources that are not free and open source. Um, but also on the contrary, that source can be used as a questioning for papacy. But in any case, um, so that's, that's something, that's a significant thing about this Pope St. Martin source, because if, Shafe happened you, to have and, and I'll just, as a, a quick thing for forget, you brought up an interesting thing. Um, it's sadly not even in the a publicly available Latin that they does encode because it was right, written like right afterwards. Exactly, and, it was in the, um, it's in the the the, the Simondian novels, I think. Oh, yeah, and, and so yeah. the point is, you even have a Western Roman emperor writing the Rome that they have the dignity of being, you know, first in the church from both tradition and from being capital of the empire. Exactly. And so yeah. when people debate Canon 3 wasn't accepted in Rome, you see its rationale accepted in the West. You see it's, yeah. it's, you it's see the in, canon, in Western Rome. canon, right? It's only after Chalcedon it became an issue. So it's, but even I wasn't aware of that because I didn't have access to that in the Latin, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. You're the one who brought that up to me. So um, it's, it shows you like really when you get really deep in the weeds, you need to get to a lot of academic sources for this. And a lot of stuff is mm -hmm. fairly recent um, in availability. Absolutely, absolutely true, and so that's why this Pope, this Pope Martin quote is just given how. Look, even, granting whether it's being read right or not, which I think you've clearly demonstrated, the reading of that quote is actually it means what it says and says what it means. But, but even putting that to the side, this is a ripe quote for anti-papalist polemics, and so if it was available in the Shafe collection, it'd probably be like the number one cited quote on this issue. Um, and it's really it really only doesn't have that position precisely because it's not in a, in a in a popularly known and popularly available collection. And so that really does demonstrate the the massive impact of the availability of information um, for people. And, and it really actually also acts as a bit of a litmus test for just how um, diligent 
historians slash apologists in these issues are whether We're they are religion. whether they, <laughs> <laughs> whether whether they're actually because there are sources which if they knew if they knew about them they would absolutely employ them but the fact that they don't employ them means that they didn't find them which is evidence that they didn't that they're they're the heuristic, their uh, method of search is just not very robust, um, and so and so that's that's a massive significance with the Pope Martin quote for me in this particular matter. And, and, then, yeah. and you know, and it's just so people are aware, it's not a mistranslation; it's the same in Latin. Um, very often in my book, I will give PL citations for like stuff that's like really it said that, and um, I will put the Latin there, so then people could scrutinize it themselves. Yeah, very good and very reasonable. Now, I think uh, the ending example we'll finish on. Can you can you guess now what the big final one we want to talk about is? I really have no clue. So okay, I'll say it again. We did a stream on this a while ago. Anastasius. Yes. Oh, okay. Let's 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 talk about let let us talk about the uh, what seems to be Machiavelli before Machiavelli in the in the papal ranks. So like, the more yeah. I learn about Anastasius, it's just the more interesting he becomes. Like just today, I was reading, it was just translated to English by uh, Caleb of Atlanta, a very good Orthodox blog from a young man. Uh, may God help him. I always afraid for people that are too smart. So he seems like a smart cook. And uh, that being said, uh, Dodecabiblius, uh, book seven from uh, Docythius II of Jerusalem. Right, so you already tell this has not never been in English. It's actually a Russian translation, machine translated English, and thank God, uh, machine translations of Russian tend to be very, very good and very easy to to touch up where the they say like kind of weird stuff. And so I'm reading this today, and with all the stuff I read about Anastasius, I don't know if I was just tired or something. I never found it, but I found the most interesting accusation was that um, Anastasius when he was like deposed as any Pope or invalidated, right? Cause there's no real, cause remember, he was Pope. People, people talk about, he was Pope, right? He, he, he got the permission from the Holy Roman Emperor, which they needed at the time to be Pope. And then they had to depose him as Pope. And the deposition was, well, he slept with the last Pope's wife. So we, so we have a, a Pope of Rome, Anastasius, that both kill was part of killing a pope's wife and sleeping with another pope's wife. <laughs> but I just laugh at because the absurdity of it. Yeah. Um, that you know this this is really the stuff that was floating around this this character. Um, but another thing came out again. I just read this today, right? Literally reading this before this stream. I did a reader's vespers, uh, and then before this, uh, I was reading uh, this book. Um, which is this this theory truly I made up of Anastasius uh, falsifying the Latin text? The so Sisyphus the Second wrote about the same stuff, not in the in the uh, textual critical detail that I did, because textual criticism didn't exist in the 17th century. But it shows you I'm not the first guy to even like infer this. And this is something that comes up uh, in my book: is that um, without a shadow of doubt, Anastasius has had a profound effect, a profound effect on the um, history of the papacy intellectually. And I would say even practically speaking, because he was part of a, a false ecumenical council, like he was actually there, by the way. He wrote letters for popes that created a schism, which is called the Photian schism, but that's just Roman schism too in, in reality. And um, this is stuff that is mainstream and easy to find. But again, like as you were referring to before, because all of apologetics is quote mine arguments and stuff from open source stuff. No one's reading the Anastasi stuff, which is all an academic text. And so no one ever talks about it. Yeah. You know, um, it's not the Wikipedia article. It's a very dry Wikipedia article. So no one ever talks about it. But if you actually read the scholarship, you start realizing how much he was doing and um, how much he was being innovative. And, and I think that's the part I'm bringing out. I'm going to go, wait a second. And we have the stream on it, so I won't get to the details. I'd say watch the stream, Anastasius the Librarian, Event of the Papacy. Yep. Anastasius pretty much invents every major papal doctrine. And I'll even issue a correction from that stream because I was 
when I, at that point where I came to this conclusion, I'm like, I'm not sure if I'm going to write about this in the book. It's just, it's just, I was flabbergasted that this could be true. And obviously at this point, I've become much more settled in this, you know, as the more time goes on and the more evidence I get, it just, it gets even more solid. Um, I would say is I expressed doubt before that Anastasia is at least in an event in direct jurisdiction. Now, reading and rereading and looking at the Latin, not so much the Greek, because uh, Greek for me is harder to deal with. I can, you know, have the individual words and looked up and stuff like that. But over and over and over, the idea of direct jurisdiction was added as an interpolation into the letter of um, Pope Adrian to the emperors in the extended ending. And it was kind of like this justification for jurisdiction in the Balkans. And the idea is, as I get into my book, is because what ultimately happened was St. Ignatius of Constantinople, not Ignatius of Antioch, guys. This is a later patriarch of Constantinople. He pretty much says, okay, I'm not giving jurisdiction to the Balkans. So that whole council of bringing Ignatius back in 869 didn't achieve anything anyway. So that's why Rome's like, oh, well, screw this. And he then falsifies into the letter this claim to jurisdiction by virtue of being the um, inheritor of Peter. Um, and so, and being ecumenical Pope, by the way, which there's this second ecumenical patriarch controversy, which I won't get into right now. So why is this relevant? I, I firmly come to the conclusion every single Vatican I distinctive was actually invented by Anastasius the librarian. Um, and if you go, well, my conclusion's too far, at least we could firmly say this. Every Vatican I distinction was found in something written, translated, whether faithfully or not, by Anastasius Librarian, or in something where he gives his own opinions. Um, when you take away the papal presuppositions, like, well, I could find Pope Leo the Great sounding, saying something sounding really great. I could find Pope Boniface the First saying something sounding really great. But then they have to import a lot of categories of thoughts, a lot of presumptions to make them equal Vatican I. For the first time, you explicitly find someone connecting the dots. All happens to be one guy, is Anastasius Librarian. I really don't like this conclusion because I really am against the great man. It makes you history. sound it makes you sound a bit conspiratorial. It makes you sound like a nut. I don't like this conclusion. <laughs> I don't want to believe this conclusion. All our problems come from Anastasius. Let me take the let me take the, the the cope interpretation. After the eighth century, when the Vatican states became their own country, they started vesting themselves with more and more prerogatives and forgeries in order to justify their existence, the diplomatic position within Central Italy, which was very precarious. And over time, that grew and grew and grew until the Crusade. Right? I could say that party line. The fact is, the facts don't bring it out. It just sounds good because it sounds less outrageous. But sometimes history is outrageous. The Holocaust was outrageous. <laughs> right? Like uh, Outrageous things do happen. When they write history of um, a recent disease, which I won't name so no one gets deplatformed, <laughs> people go, this is outrageous. You know, Because, mm -hmm. yeah, outrageous things do happen. They don't happen all the time. Right, like it's kind of like in the Bible where people go, well, why don't miracles happen more today than they happened in the past? Like, have you read the Bible? Right, a miracle happen like every hundred years. Like, it happens very rare when yeah. we have like really super cool miracles, right? Yeah, the Bible's not going to be writing about. Hmm, today, Joachim got up and had breakfast, and he had an argument with some guys, and that was his day. <laughs> <laughs> right. So it's like most of life is mundane. Most things aren't outrageous, but rarely outrageous things do happen. Yep. And the history, I believe, brings out that Anastasius created all of the Vatican I ideas, and then they, they start having a basis in the textual history of the West. So when the Hildebrandian reforms occur, it, it's not like they pulled it out of their ears, right? It's like, look, it's in all these ancient sources. And at that point, they're over 200 years old. Paper looks old. It you know, looks legit. And that's that's pretty much what happens in the West. Um I will leave this one little kernel, this little tidbit, because where all the people go crazy, here's my challenge to you, my dear friends, all right? The rules of retroversions of text are that 
a retroversion is you take a language like Latin, you translate it into Greek, and then you translate back to Latin. So that's why it's a retroversion. You you made a translation, yeah. turn it back into whatever its original language was, but from not the original language. Okay. Now, Anastasius, when he translated Nicaea too, made a retroversion. He was theoretically using the Greek. Now, by the rules of retroversion, his Latin should never, ever match any fragments of the original Latin. It should be pretty much impossible for that to occur because in retroversion, it's just you, you'll use similar words to mean similar things. You're not going to always guess the exact same word. And, right? and word order as well, which is another in word order. It's just yeah. it's, it's impossible. Right? So you can't have an, it's an exact match is virtually impossible. Pretty much take a word and then take the next word and take the next word as an exponent, as a, a, coin, chip, a, a coin flip. And then by the time you get, I don't know, 300 words down, it'll be, you know, two to the 300th power chance that you've got it right all that time, right? It becomes impossible. I don't even know what that number is. It's absurdly, <laughs> it's like quadrillions of quadrillions of quadrillions. I don't know. It's, it's gigantic. Where am I getting at? Is that when you look at non-papal passages, because we have fragments in the Collectigo Britannica, it's not published. You can't copy and paste it. It's a manuscript. But you could read the manuscript because I think in the last year they digitized it. So you could turn the pages. You can't copy and paste anything. But you could look at the actual manuscript, the pictures of it. right? Just like you can see with certain Dead Sea Scrolls and stuff like that if you're into this. Mm. So you could do this yourselves, my dear friends. You don't need to take my word for it. Well, you'll have to buy the critical edition of Lambers, which you're probably not be able to find your normal. Person. Or uh, yeah. or go to a certain website with um, PDFs. But in any case, <laughs> I don't think you can get that as a PDF, by the way. But maybe you can. Whatever. Point is, you go to the Collectio Britannica. You look at the fragments of uh, Pope Adrian's letter to the emperors that are just about icons, right? They're not about papal prerogatives. N nothing matches because it's retroverted. It's saying the same stuff if you translate the Latin, right? You could tell it's he's faithfully translating the Greek. But in every single papal passages, they are ad verbatim the same until you get like maybe 10 lines down, until you get to like, I don't know, the 300th word. Now you have a, a different word with a, like, with a similar meaning. Fascinating. Meaning it was literally lifted either identically from the early Latin which Anastasius didn't say he did, or Anastasius wrote it, and that's what's in the papal correspondence now. It was not retroverted. And so this literally disproves Lambert's thesis. Father Richard Price, what he faithfully repeats. And people say, oh, you know, Craig's a nut. How dare he disagree with scholars, even though the view that the Greek was the authentic reading of Nicaea II's majority view of scholarship, you even find it in works like Sachensky's in 2017. Right, so it's not like this bizarre, very old idea. It's an idea that you find in Dvornik and you find in Luth. You find it in all sorts of very esteemed scholars. I just gave to you the key, and you could look at it yourself because it's all openly available to you. You don't even have to know Latin that well. You can just compare Latin words to prove what I'm saying. I'm telling you is true. There is zero signs of retroversion. It was not in the Greek. It was not read in Nicaea too. It's literally impossible. And that was just proof to you. My book is the first to come out with that. I will have future work which actually gets into more details. Um, this book, because it's 350 pages, it's not going to get to all the minutia of that. But I pose that to you so people, you can't laugh. You have to do the hard work of history because there are facts you have to deal with. You Calling me names, calling me schizo, or whatever, just shows you don't have an answer to the facts. And for actual Christians out there that aren't coping, that actually want to look at this truthfully, they're not gonna look at insults and discount things. They're gonna look at facts. They're gonna look at this book. They're gonna look at articles that talk about this stuff. And they're gonna have to deal with it. And just so you know, um, if someone says, well, the extended ending the letter wouldn't have signed to retroversion because Anastasius claimed he restored it from the original Latin. Thank you, Anastasius. I trust you, by the way, right? Um, he doesn't do that with the earlier passage um, of he doesn't claim that he restored the earlier passage uh, with all the papal claims in the beginning of the letter, right? So mm -hmm. you start finding that, wait, Anastasius really wasn't authentic and genuine with his methodology. We have proof of this. And he starts seeing that all these presumptions they make that we can just trust the Latin minutes and that, you know, because Lambert said so, you can't do that because his 
thesis has actually just been falsified for you on the other poll. So it's uh, well first, baby. I think it's fascinating, but the beauty is I just gave you the keys to the kingdom, guys. Go check it out. It, it's really not that complicated. It just so, takes time. It's so lazy. They don't want to put time in anything. They just want to call names because it takes less time. So to, so to dumb it down a bit, to make it as easy as possible for people to follow everything you said there. In summary, a retro version is you have a Greek text, um, you have, then it's translated into Latin, and then that Latin is back translated into Greek. Um, and so... No, Latin, uh, Latin into Greek back into Greek. Sorry, yep, yeah, the other way around. So Latin into Greek, back to Latin. Um, and, so with, and so with that, obviously you'd expect that it's going to be in substance the same text between the original Latin versus the retro translated Latin but they're going to be different in their wording and all that stuff because it's a retro translation. It's not trying to be an exact, um, otherwise it wouldn't be a retro version. It'd just be a copy of an original, but in any case, so there's supposed to be differences, but when there's particular passages where suddenly there's an exact match in the wording between the so-called original Latin, um, and the retro retroverted Latin, that's evidence that, um, and, and please correct me if I've got that completely wrong, but that's evidence that those matching passages were actually added to those documents later on. Yes, because if we were retroverted, then the um, you wouldn't have ad verbatim agreement, right. Yeah. right? And so this shows that there's one of two possibilities. The moral certainty is where we could be absolutely certain that it was not in the Greek because the retroversion proves that. The, and the lack of retroversion proves that. So there's one or two possibilities. One is Anastasius always faithfully copied ad verbatim from an earlier Latin source. And I will grant that's a theoretical possibility for the longer ending. Now, I make other textual critical arguments where we can find interpolations, by the way. But that is at least theoretically possible. And the other possibility is that they were all just devised by the Latin translator because there's no signs of retroversion. It's just a it's a indication of his own Latin at that juncture. Um, and so I feel that this is something that, uh, if you want my own personal opinion, I think that Anastasius actually made insertions into the Pope Adrian's registry because he was the papal librarian and that's where the letters were. And then he did that earlier than his translation of Nicaea II, when there was still a patri ecumenical patriarch controversy. And then when that controversy was over, he, that's when he actually made the Nicaea II translation, but he uses his old source material, his doctored um, letters from the Latin. Um, and so, again, you can go, well, I don't, I don't accept all those different, you know, um, multiple layers or whatever. Fine. I mean, because that's what text criticism is. There, there are layers like that. But then what you have to accept is it just was not in the Greek. It was not read during Nicaea do. I mean, that we have moral certainty about. Because mm. it's not in the retro version of the Greek. So we know right. it was never in the Greek. And it's not in any of the exact extant Greek now. So it's, uh, I mean, that's slammed up. Fascinating, very fascinating. And, and, and to... I, I want to add one more challenge, by the way. Yes. This Anastasia stuff, I've noticed no one else pick up on. But it's at this point in videos with almost 10,000 views between on um, Orthodox Ethos and on this channel. And then with this video, there'll be more. And there's no serious response. There's no serious response. You know, um, my my documentary, it's got 32,000 views. Uh, Errors the Catholic Schism documentary, it's got almost 30,000 views. Why is there no response? Because you notice that there's no way of critically dealing with, well, what do we deal with with these sources that aren't fitting these anachronistic narratives? And they don't have a response. I, I think people need to get to the drawing board and start doing real history. And, and that's what this book does. And that's why I really want people to buy this. But even if they want to disagree with it, is because this book does real history. And I think if you're actually interested in this topic, instead of wasting your time with endless uh, streams and the effeminate, uh, the effeminate controversies and, and backbiting and gossip, how about you do some real history? And this, this will get you on the road. And at least then you can lose the, use the bibliography and get more books. Okay. Yeah. Fascinating. Do real history, people. That's also my uh, also my call for everyone as well on all these issues. 
So that is a fascinating oat to uh, note to finish up the main chunk of this on. We are now going to move to Q and A. So we only have a we only have a small number of questions so far. So unless people add more questions after the fact, this is going to get uh, done fairly quickly, and we'll end it at a, at a decent time with this uh, excellent stream so far. So actually, before we get on to Q and A, Craig, thank yeah. you a ton for giving the details on your book and your promo of it, and why people should get it. It is something that is truly unique in the area of uh, dialogue with uh, with Rome on ecclesiology. Um, so where can people pick up your book? They could get it at Amazon.com. Even if you're in a foreign country, apparently they do print on demand for the foreign countries. So you shouldn't have wacky shipping. So there you go. You could get Amazon.com. Um, it's apparently free to read with Kindle Unlimited. I don't know. I take advantage right. of that. I'm a cheap person. So there you go. Um, and uncutmountainpress.com, of course. Um, I think if you support the publisher, it helps us publish more works. Um, and so definitely go to uncutmountainpress.com um, and you can purchase this book. Yep. And this is it right here, the link to Uncut Mountain Press, um, of where you can get the book over there. Not a bad, uh, not a bad price by the looks of it for something that is quite unique in this uh, in this whole field of uh, of uh, dialogue and polemics and apologetics with uh, with Rome. Um, so uh, so yeah, people do grab that. I cannot wait for when my copy finally arrives. It is going to be rad to uh, have the physical book in hand. Obviously, I yeah. uh, exactly Paul's a physical, physical copy guy. Exactly, exactly. I'm a physical. I have, I have a, I have a digital version, and uh, you know, it's, it's the content, which is obviously what you want. But nothing beats having the book in your hands. That's just, that's just a fact. Anyone who says otherwise is uh, a problem. Is what's wrong with the modern world? But in any case, that's where you, that's those places are where you can grab the book, people, from uncutmountainpress.com uh, as well as from Amazon itself. Now on the Q and A. Uh, um, by the way, yeah. I like that comment from John MC where he says that uh, he's for years been doing. Whoops! There goes my screen. <laughs> uh oh, wow! I'm gonna maybe all right. Good, you brought it up. Um, rip. Uh oh, am I still here? Yeah, you. I can hear you, but your webcam's not on. That's very good. All right, you're dealing with a. Uh, all right, I'm gonna work on that, but I'll talk while I'm working on it. Where he says, having done this in academic exercise translating from Greek to Latin to English and back for years, it's virtually impossible to reproduce supposedly original Greek. So, again, you know, anyone that knows anything about translations knows what I'm saying is the mm -hmm. case. Yeah, yeah. And actually, do remind me quickly. So, um, the documents in play is we have a Latin original of these texts, then we have a Greek translation of the Latin, and then a retro version from Greek back to Latin, correct? In reality, we have fragments of only the original Latin. It, there, it's, sure, trans, yeah, sure. it's translated like there's certain excerpts in the Council of Paris, you know, Car Carolingian books and stuff like sure, that. Sure, right, right, right. Um, so, and then, yeah. and then what we have otherwise, in, as an attack copy, is what Anastasius Librarian translated from Latin. And then we have essentially four different Greek text types, Greek families right. of manuscripts. And so, what that first Latin text is that? What's the relation? to that, to like the original Greek minutes? Was there like two original minutes, one in Greek, one in Latin, or? It was originally in Greek, and then Pope Adrian I had it translated into right. um, into Latin, hoping that the uh, the Franks would sign on to it. Right, okay. And then that was translated into Greek again, and then Anastasius translated that back into Latin, or retro-translated it back into Latin, and he inserted in both the original well the original latin he was working with as well as his retro translation he inserted papal passages does yes. that make it because there's a lot of moving parts here, so i want to make sure that i and everyone else watching has that in mind but i guess that's why i can read your book as well there you go that's uh <laughs> get the book the, so, that's um, i would say the most complicated part of the book in all honesty because it's sex criticism um and, yeah. and and that's why i just i start that section very simply like saying essentially if we just like, take that the latin and greek are different then essentially the fall of the papacy started after the vatican states stuff right it's not a, that would be a very controversial thesis um and then when you if you want to dig a little deeper then you find there's a little more going on and and that's mm -hmm. when i get to the text criticism and again because i i don't know i'd like to expect a lot from a reader that they're going to want to dig into facts and get into this stuff 
Hundred percent, hundred percent. Now, what, here's an interesting one from uh, from my man Jeff here. What would you what would you think about this? Need to set up a debate with a major Catholic player on this info, and then maybe get traction. Um. Well, I think the book already has traction by how it's selling. So I'm grateful for that, and uh, I think there'll be um, a, th- a few more interviews that will be big. Um, but again, it's unlike you who's had this book for some time. People need some time to read it. Um, so I'm very, I'm very grateful that uh, the the real debut has been on your channel, other than on the publisher's uh, channel. And um, I'm honored about as for that. as for a debate, there's an open invitation. I won't get into names, but. One big name's like, uh, could he give me the book in advance and then I'll decide? I'm like, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you all my debating points. Then you decide where they're going to debate me. I mean, at this point, all right, now at least you could buy the book. And then when you buy the book, you could decide where they're going to debate me. So at this point, <laughs> um, right, like, you know, I'd be at an obvious disadvantage because you, you have pretty much my hand in front of you um, when you have the book. But absolutely, I would defend these things because, quite frankly, um, when it comes to, you know, the stuff about Nicaea 2 or any of these individual facts, I'll debate anyone alive on it because the facts are on my side. The sources say what they say. Um, and the bigger guys, you can't say, oh, well, Craig's not big enough. Because I, when I speak to any of these big name Roman Catholic apologists, they know who I am. And they mention videos I've been in. I have videos with tens of thousands of views, right? It's... People don't want to debate it because the uh, I think they debates. Let's be honest, Paul. We've talked about this. Debates are like prize fighting. They pick matches, and there's matches where like there's the guy that's supposed to be defeated, so they're gonna go up to the next guy and stuff like that. Um, and so a lot of these big time debaters, they're not mastered the you know I'm not gonna say it. They're not actual absolute experts at debating. They they choose. They choose opponents and they won't fight other opponents because they're afraid. And the reality is this is the strongest, most intact argument against the Roman Catholic position. Who will have the gumption to say something about it? And I think that says a lot. Um, I will also say this so people are aware, I'm not going to debate people that are calling me names and stuff because here's why. I know for myself, I am not going to fight with a hand behind my back. If I'm going to debate someone that calls me names, I'm going to start calling names back. And I just don't see how Christians are edified by that. And so pretty much there has to be a basic good faith. It's not me running. It's called actually, believe me, I'm from New York. I can make it a lot dirtier on you (laughs) if I want to. And I'm not going to because I just don't think it's right. Um, And against my... I'd say not against my better judgment. My better judgment is it's better just not to even cross that Rubicon. But anyone who legit who's legitimate that's not going to be name calling, I'll debate them. It, you know, even like Alan Rule, we had a debate on Lateran 649 after Spencer's book, right? It was a fair, it was a nice debate. And um, and so the reality is it's like it's not that I won't talk to people. It's just the question is whether they're willing to really confront what's here. And if they're not, it shows you because they don't know how. Five, big spicy invitation there for anybody else listening. Um, now we'll actually get to the questions themselves. So first one here by Matt Schneider. Sean Luke's arguments against papal infallibility based on apostolica cure is one of the most unanswerable arguments against papal infallibility. Is Craig familiar with this? No, because I'm really not interested in going to the Roman Catholic sources, swimming with their current and trying to disprove them through eternal reasons. You know, um, my training has been in history and history education. Um, I'm just more interested in history. Fair enough. To, to give, um, to give a brief rundown on it, um, to give a brief rundown on his argument is basically because Apostolic Curie, uh, it is a document issued in the uh, mid to late 20th century by the Roman church basically declaring that Anglican holy orders are null and utterly void. Um, and Sean Luke has done material responding to it, utilizing the official Anglican response actually as well, um, where their main arguments against the holy orders that we don't, uh, in our ordination rites, we don't give the intention of the, we don't explicitly state the intention of the priest to be offering the sacrifice, the Eucharist. Uh, it's inconsistent because Rome accepts, say, baptisms by Baptists, 
who clearly don't have the intention of baptismal regeneration, as well as the fact that even older ordination rites within Rome itself, including uh, on including from the, the apostolic tradition, the, the text, um, don't make the clear, explicit intention of Eucharistic sacrifice either. So um, among other arguments. And so, yeah, I mean, and, yeah. and come on, is someone who became a bishop when they're eight years old because of money had the was the attention there to make a real bishop? It's I find <laughs> these arguments self eviscerating ultimately, um, which is why I'm really not too interested in it. I, I, if we went by that, I think simony would have destroyed the church way, way before all of this. Right. Yeah, that's a good point. Also, congrats on the book. Can't wait for Catholic Craig's response. <laughs> no, Catholic happy? Craig doesn't have a whole book in him. <laughs> <laughs> what about some so, little? What about what about what about some little uh some little cope replies one day? Um, I don't know. I it's I'm getting older and tired. Catholic Craig requires a lot of uh a lot of energy in in a, a pithy sort of mood. So we'll have to see. Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, did he? I, I presume this is talking about you, Craig. Did he look at the Council of Chalcedon? It's one of those events leveraged by Roman Catholics to prove the papacy, but the stuff I've read seems to point to the opposite. Yeah, Chalcedon's covered in detail. It covers how Leo's um, deposition of uh, Dioscorus of Alexandria apparently wasn't considered binding because Dioscorus was um, treated as a bishop until he was deposed by the council itself. In fact, we have a letter from Leo where he even says that's what we're going to do. Um, so this whole idea, like the Pope settled it and the council kind of plays catch up. Um, something I actually Anastasius came up with that idea um so the, it's you know uh, we could see where that originates but that being said it's it's just not something that's in chalcedon sources but i deal with it in detail and i don't i don't get to the plain old oh well why'd they review leo's letter you know if leo was infallible and so because that's not the main right that's not the main forces at work because right infallibility didn't exist at the time so you can't expect like that would have been something that would have carried a lot of importance in its day. It just would have been organically happened. Um, I actually get into some pretty big pro-papal stuff in Chalcedon, which I think are neglected by people who don't read the minutes. Um, so like, for example, Dioscorus is criticized for not allowing the reading of the Toma Leo. And um, St. Juvenal and Dioscorus give different reasons. Like, you know, Juvenal says like something like, I was distracted by the reading of the letter of the emperors. And that's why we didn't do it. Like, right. If why did they just simply say we didn't have to, what the Pope Rome says doesn't necessarily go. Why did no one talk that way? Right. So like the, the typical normie Protestant Orthodox response where, Oh, the Pope says doesn't matter. That's not found in the sources, right? Because they're actually giving very cagey responses. Why they never, uh, they allow the reading of the Toma Leo during the council of Ephesus too. Um, however, if you read this in context, the idea is because technically all the patriarchs are supposed to have participation in a, in a true ecumenical council. So if the legate is bringing, this is what this patriarch has to say, of course you have to have it read and you need some, you need some excuse for why it wasn't read. But the fact that you never hear Roman apologists bringing that up and you hear people spouting apologetic talking points, which sound very stupid and you read the sources, is because they're not reading the sources. But the there book gets go. into it. There you go. And what looks like the final question by Matt Scarpelli, do you think Anastasius may be the most interesting and important person that nobody really talks about? Absolutely. There it is. He is probably in the top 10. I mean... If you're thinking religion, he could be it's he's in the top ten of macro historical important people, right? Like Genghis Khan, you know, Napoleon. Um, I'd argue closer to Stalin like than really Hitler, actually, but you know, stuff like that of people that they made such a change in history that if they didn't exist, it would have went in a completely unrecognizable direction. And Anastasius is up there and Sort of like uh, in the West, people will say that St. Augustine's the most important writer since St. Paul. And I'd say arguably that's true for the Western tradition. This is the way he, eter he eternalized it and explained it and how it later got um, categorized and used in the West. I mean, there'd be a lot of truth to that. But I'd say then, if we're going to say that, the most important writer in the Western tradition after Augustine is Anastasius. Is that important? 
big claim, big claim. And then Matt further asked, so should I write my senior thesis on him? Absolutely. I mean, it's, I mean, there's, there's this book, there's many others. Um, Anastasius is very, very important. And I, I got into this in the Anastasius stream is why haven't historians really got more into this? And I think it's because they like that Anastasius made a lot of manuscripts available, right? Um, another thing, and the scholar's name is skipping my mind at the moment. He's huge in the pseudo historian decretals. He's an American who moved to Germany to get into it. Like, you know, because that's where the real legit scholars are in Germany. So he, um, he's American. His name's skipping my mind. Uh, if he sees this, he'll hate me. But the, the point being is um, a lot of this research only came out in the last few years. And there's a growing appreciation for like the methodology of uh, a forgery. And I think once we take that growing appreciation of methodology and forgery and recent scholarship and apply that to Anastasius, you start realizing that, yeah, this is a guy where we got stuff to research on it. Personally, I'd like to see everything Anastasius wrote translated to English. I think he's that important. I think having everything he wrote is that important. Fascinating. And it looks like we actually have one more final question for Craig. What's the best Roman rejoinder for all the irregularities from a Roman perspective surrounding the council of Constantinople one? Um, they could just simply say the Bishop of Rome didn't accept it, which yeah. really isn't true because they accepted the canons. And, and this is something like people that look at history OCD don't understand is this such thing as lack of better terms, partial acceptance. Right, um, where they'll accept canons, they'll accept the creed, but they won't accept a deposition, or they won't accept the appended document, or they won't accept an ordination or something like that. Because councils will do all those and above, right? But doesn't mean someone else approves of everything. And one of the texts I bring up, because a lot of the uh, the papal copism with Pope Gregory the Great is like, oh, I can't believe um, Orthodox say Pope Gregory the Great you know, uh, disproves the papacy. Look at this big papal quote that Pope Gregory the Great said, you know, that Rome never accepted this. And that must mean that's all that matters. Rome never accepted this. In one of these letters where he says this, if you keep reading the same letter, he says, and uh, Milan, no, Ravenna. And Ravenna never accepted the third letter of Cyril to Nestorius. Right? So apparently he didn't view this idea that like you could receive one thing and not the other as something that only Rome did because he actually in the same breath then talks about this is what Ravenna did. And just so people are aware, um, in the Fifth Ecumenical Council, that letter is considered authoritative. So it shows you that there was a church in communion with Rome that didn't really fully receive the Fifth Ecumenical Council against explicitly how the Roman church did. Now, it makes sense when you have the full context of history, but it makes no sense the anachronistic ways in which we look at the papacy. There you go. There you go. Final comment. Late getting to the stream. Craig's book is great so far, about 150 pages in. Yep. Please, uh, if you could leave reviews, whether in comments, um, Amazon, honestly, I'd like to collate some of these reviews into something. I, I got one review that was emailed to the press and it was sent to me. I haven't got the permission to, to restate anything. But like, it was a real honor because the person was actually dealing with the sources, saying every source that, you know, from someone in the know that needs to see was in this book. Um, I'll, I'll quote two words from it. They called the Magnum Opus, you know, this book. It's, you know, like, oh, why did you write that in Amazon, you know? And it wouldn't be Mike Lofton writing it, right? Um, you know, in a fake review. Um, so it's a, uh, I'm very pleased with the feedback of the book so far. And I think if people, make their feedback public, it will get other people to read the book. So please do so. Certainly, certainly. Um, I'll possibly give it one day. Although in fairness for me, if I wanted to give a review of something, I'd have to comprehensive. <laughs> Often I have the, the need to comprehensively study everything it says so that people don't say, oh, look, you got this wrong and you're endorsing it. When you it. get your physical copy, yeah. I'd appreciate a review, even if it's critical. When I, it's like I wrote a book review for John Carl Rothy's Keys of the Christian World. It's actually one of my top viewed articles because apparently whenever someone Googles a book, they read my book review. Oh, there you go. And if, and if they read the book review, it's actually very kind about the book. I give very specific things I disagree. I give a certain part where I agree with stuff and whatnot. So, like, I would I would appreciate a book review as long as it just critically dealt with it. You don't have to say it's great, it's bad, or whatever, typos. 100%. Point is, I you know, I, I'm just interested in interaction. 
I'm honestly thinking about maybe even putting it in my um do you do you do you know um I've got like a uh we've only got a couple entries so far really but a, a book review series on my channel just called recommended sources where sauces. I give yeah, yeah so, so maybe yeah, that's the sauce man sauces yeah rec- yeah that's because uh, with our accent we don't really distinguish we have like primary like in the sense of primary source secondary source we have source but then if we're talking about like like tomato sauce we we say sauce as well <laughs> but at least with, with your accent you can kind of distinguish you would say hey guys i have the primary primary sources uh oh by the way here's some uh, tomato sauce so at least you can actually distinguish between it but we can't <laughs> so so the, the the pun doesn't really work well verbally I, I, I know an australian guy whose name is carl right i know an australian guy whose name is carl and uh wow. Apparently, because he lived he lived in America for a period of time, and he kind of like his accent kind of got bungled. Oh, that when yeah. he says his name, no one knows he's saying Carl, and so now he just goes by his Orthodox name. He actually legally changed it to his Orthodox name. Oh wow, that's nice. Okay, okay. <laughs> um, but yeah, so, I, that, that's, that's how honestly... Australians say the the letter R. That's why that's the point of the story. Yeah, that's that's largely it. Honestly, once I once I get the book and read through it, that's. And if I do enjoy it as, as much as I've enjoyed um, what I've seen so far in the digital, well, it's pretty much the same because I'm still going through it. I haven't read the full thing yet. But if it, if that trajectory holds up, I'll probably honestly make it a recommended sources video. That'll be uh, pretty, that'll be, honestly be pretty appropriate for it in my opinion. So with that said, oh, and here we go. Patrick has done the work. I know because I know the bibliography well. There you go. There you go. There go. I don't know what John MC is, but thank you. <laughs> there you go. Now, ladies and gentlemen, with that said, we have passed two hours, 15 minutes for a very awesome and meaty discussion in uh, promoting Craig's excellent book, The Rise and Fall of the Papacy. Do make sure you go check it out. There is a link to the Amazon page posted right here in the live chat by Matt Bell, but there's also a direct link to the Uncut Mountain Press purchase page in the description below. So do go to either of those and pick up the book today. It is really a fantastic read and genuinely a fresh contribution to these discussions and in light of that craig thank you so much for joining me today thank you it's been a real it's been a real good interview i appreciate it 100 percent agree and as usual in uh, light with our collabs uh, with myself and craig as the wisdom of sirach says fight to the death for the truth and the lord god will fight for you have a great day or evening people god bless